All right, I'd like to call the order the August 12, 2024 Mount Lake Terrace Planning Commission meeting the order. Would you please take the roll? Chair Batista. Here. Vice Chair Harrison. We see Here. You. Commissioner Stenson. Here. Commissioner Thompson. Here. Commissioner Morgan. Here. Commissioner Betcher. Here. Commissioner Landis. I'm here. All right, item number three, approval of the July 22nd, 2024 meeting minutes. Does anybody have any changes or corrections to those? I am not hearing or seeing anything, so we'll go ahead and declare those uh, accepted as presented. And we have a little bit of change in order tonight, so we're going to be some swapping some places. So the new item number, f um, the item number four, Jenna, is going to be draft comprehensive plan review. Or, wait, hold on. Never mind. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Number four was public comment, so uh, I apologize. It's Monday. Um, do we have anybody in person who's wanting to make any kind of public comment tonight? I see we have some people, so I just want to double check. We have someone signed up online um, to make public comment. Okay, so since we actually have someone uh, online for public comment, let me just go ahead and... Um, read the spiel. So for public comment, uh, no person shall make any personal attacks or threatening remarks while addressing the planning commission, which disrupts, disturbs, or otherwise impedes the orderly conduct of the meeting. Any person who is engaging in this conduct that disturbs, disrupts, or impedes the business of the planning commission or whose comments have been ruled out of order by the presiding officer shall immediately cease and refrain from further improper comments or inappropriate conduct. All hate speech will be construed as threatening remarks. Thank you. May we have Jen Lian speak first? Uh, Jen, your microphone is currently muted. We can hear you now. Uh, so may I, uh, I'm not sure if, uh, my wife is, uh, here that is she, uh, I want to give her a chance to uh, talk. Is this Jeff Lowe? Yes. If you'd like, you may speak first. Uh, cause the agenda of this meeting, uh, I thought it would be, uh, Kind, kind of a someone will give a presentation before we were given a chance to talk, right? It's not the case. Are you wanting to um, talk about an, uh, an item that's actually on our agenda for tonight? Because she said she has submitted something in writing. Uh, she incur uh, I, I think um, she planned to uh, to have that writing material to be submitted, the re, you know, the written material. Um, what was submitted was a request to speak in person or online. No, um, not just that request. She actually, she submitted uh, the home owner's position for strongly opposing installing the transformers on property to the commission meeting uh, by filing this online form that she did. Because basically, 
uh, to make a long story short, uh, our property was um, planned with this project to install a transformer um, very close, very, very close to, uh, uh, you know, the major location of all these uh, bedrooms. And um, we were um, having uh, big concerns regarding the health issues related to the installation of a transformer that is so close to us. Um, I think I already talked to the mayor in the past regarding this. And um, I was told that it is flexible, at least um, I think a couple of months ago, uh, this, um, the initial, I think the comments I gave is on the uh, 6th of June, June 6th, that it's the first time I spoke about this. I said um, you should actually um, reevaluate the plan to see if there's other workarounds without having to uh, put the transformers um, so close to us. And um, um, maybe, I mean, one option is to the other side of the street to see if it is, um, you know, durable or maybe um, if you know, the plan is flexible enough to make it happen. And um, at least about a month ago, uh, I was told that they still um, be able to consider that as an option. But I'm not sure about the final uh, decisions and when the final decision can be made and when uh, we were given a chance to re you know, to um, talk about this, you know, uh, directly to the uh, project management to see if this particular uh, plan can be worked around. I mean, um, because right now we were not even know exactly, you know, where that transformer is going to be located. But um, from our understanding, from the negotiator, uh, uh, what the negotiator gave us a map, right? It gave us a kind of a uh, layout um, and try to explain to us uh, where it's supposed to be. But uh, still, um, we haven't got a chance to, for the, the uh, negotiator to uh, pinpoint exactly where that location is. You know, it's just uh, um, still something. Um, I think we would want to know exactly um, that's the current status. I'm not sure if um, we were will be given a chance to uh, doing the real um, the negotiation with the plan uh, with the project management to actually uh, see if there's another workaround. Um, you know, traditionally you uh, the Jeff, the negotiator here is to negotiate the compensation, right? But we we would not want to negotiate the compensation. We just want to negotiate the plan to see if there's something that you can do. Jeff, to change it. We appreciate your public comment, but I'm afraid your time has come to a close. Yeah, that's um, yeah, I that's all I want to say. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah. Thank you. Does staff have his contact information that we can? Circle back yes. with him on that? Okay, yes. thank you. Was there uh, anybody else? Uh, looks like we also have someone online. Is this uh, Jen? Can I ask you to unmute? I unmute or... Oh, yes, we can hear you now. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Thanks. Yeah, sorry about the technical issues uh, with Zoom. I'm still trying to navigate it say, more successfully with more experience. So um, I just want to uh, share some of my concerns uh, with this 
uh, matter uh, installing the transformers on or near the property um, we own. So um, I know it's been going on for a while, but I personally feel um, still um, there is not uh, a good amount of transparency between the homeowners and the project um, uh, or the people who are representing the project. Uh, I'm not 100% per sure uh, um, exactly what kind of information we should be expecting. Um, I, and I, since last time, uh, about um, one and a half months ago, we uh, share our opinions uh, slash concerns with the city councils. However, we have not uh, heard any uh, proper following up or, uh, or updates from the city uh, as we were promised. Um, so that is a disappointment. In addition, um, I have been uh, expressed numerous times um, that the, uh, the installing the transformers um, are uh, associated with um, health hazards, health concerns. Not only that, there's also physical harms. Um, there just seems more negative impact than the positive impact of installing transformers. I understand that the city uh, project uh, rev rev revisitization project requires this. However, I'm, I'm, I feel there is better solution to resolve this. Um, so I sincerely hope city uh, could listen to um, the voice from the homeowners. Um, it's just not trying to, uh, yes, uh, we heard you. However, there's no proper following up or updates. Just I feel like it's more like a, a brush off. Um, in addition, I don't know if you need me to go over some like uh, um, statistics or confirm the health findings in the uh, specific area. Uh, the transformer, uh, electrical transformer, is associated with. Um, uh, health hazards and could uh, further leading to numerous um, health dysfunctions. So that is the uh, most concerning. And um, also there are Jen? physical hazards. Yeah, those kind of things. If you are, um, you have time, I will be more than happy to share that uh, information with you. Um, but this is something, this is a fact that you can just ignore, say, hey, this Jen? is not something, yes. My apologies, but your time has come to a close. We greatly appreciate your public comment. Okay, yeah. So what should I expect as a next? Understanding staff will be able to follow up and at least provide some additional updates to the what they're referring to. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not aware oh. of the situation. It appears that they have spoken to the mayor and city council so staff will follow up and have someone get back to them on what the status of this is. I'm unaware of, of this issue. Okay. Okay. Is there any specific timeline should I expect him uh, from he hearing back from the city council or proper following up? Would you just want to uh, have a reasonable expectation? I will follow up tomorrow as a staff member um, to have somebody follow up with you. I, I I don't set timeline for council to get back to you, but I'll make the city manager aware and then anybody that we need to talk to concerning this issue. I'm, I'm kind of unaware of this issue or the transformers or who's installing them or anything like that at this point, but I will follow up tomorrow. Thank you. And I'm just double checking, we have their contact information, including the address that's probably in question. Okay. I know the poly, the way we kind of do public comments kind of changed where we don't actually ask their address anymore. So I was like, it was a little tough not knowing the area. I'm, at first, my mind was going to Main Street Project. So I don't, I don't know if that's what this is in relation to or if it's something else. But 
I'm sure you guys will be able to figure that out for them. Okay. So moving on. Just, uh, just double checking. Any other public comment or was, was those the only two? Those the only two. Okay. So we'll go ahead on to the next agenda item. Now this is where I think I got a little confused before. We're swapping five and six. So we're going to start off with the economic development strategy. Okay. All right. Item number six. <laughs> All right. Good evening, Chair Batista, Vice Chair Harrison, members of the Planning Commission, Jonathan Morales, Senior Planner. Um, wanted to uh, have an opportunity to introduce David Fiss from Leland Consulting Group, who's been our consultant on the Economic Development Strategic Plan. Um, last meeting on July 22nd, we distributed a draft and Economic Development Strategic Plan, and we requested comments from Planning Commission. Um, by August 7th. And so today, the purpose of this meeting presentation is to discuss those comments. So I'm gonna pass it to David, who has prepared a summary of comments, which should be in your packets today. Um, take it away, David. Great, thank you, Jonathan. Um, and good evening, commissioners. Good to see you all again. Um, I have a brief slide deck just to pull up. Yeah, I, I think you all should have those consolidated comments in front of you, but I. Figured I can pull them up on screen as well. There weren't um, a huge number of them, so we can sort of move through a couple of the, the questions and so I can have a chance to answer those. Uh, and then um, we can, I, I plan to really focus our discussion today on the strategic framework, the, the sort of three uh, major strategic uh, or strategies and, and the objectives and actions underneath those where we received a number of comments um, but the, for those of you that, that had not submitted comments uh, by last week, uh, this would be a good opportunity to, to discuss further as well. So um, let me pull up my screen moment, or give me a moment. All right. Are you all able to see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Um, I unfortunately cannot see you. Give me, <laughs> give me a second. There we go. Um, so I'm not just speaking to a blank screen. So uh, first off, just wanted to give a quick reminder. So uh, based on our discussion last last time, we did add another meeting on to your uh, the commission's agenda. So uh, we met on the 22nd, uh, provided some co or re received written comments from some of you uh, last week. Tonight, the 12th, we're going to discuss those comments. Um, and that should, that should say further discussion. Um, and on the 26th will be a chance to provide final comments or feedback on the plan and uh, consider uh, providing a recommendation to bring the plan to city council. And that leads us then to next month uh, in September, we'll, we'll be bringing this to City Council for a work session and then consideration for adoption. So I think that that works well. I, I, your comments were well received last time. Um, give us a chance to integrate any feedback we received tonight into a, a follow-up draft. So then on the 26th, hopefully uh, you will feel comfortable recommending that draft is brought forward to, to City Council. So with that, to hop right into it, <clears throat> really, I, I, I am pulling up just a couple of questions, pulling out from the comments we received. Uh, most, many of the comments, uh, especially on the front matter of the plan, were, or I should say the first three chapters of the plan, were, were mostly comments or things that we can just be integrated. I don't, I don't necessarily feel they needed to be brought up for discussion today, but if if um, anyone feels otherwise, please feel free to stop me. But there are a couple of questions here. And I should say we received comments just from two commissioners. Um, <clears throat> there will be chance to provide further comments, of course, before our next meeting. Um, but again, there, there's a good opportunity to, to chime in if there are thoughts from, from others. So one of the questions here uh, was about this map here, uh, about the Malik Terrace buildable lands. Um, 
So the comment, are the island lots on the map showing as redevelopable, just larger lots? Why these specific locations? And so I thought I would just spend a minute to explain what this map shows. Um, and so the redevelopable parcels <clears throat> would be the dark green ones shown on this map. <clears throat> and this is, is showing the, the official designation of, of parcels within Mount Lake Terrace's buildable lands inventory. So this is a process that every jurisdiction within Snohomish County, within um, uh, within the state, must undergo, or every fully planning uh, jurisdiction, I should say, uh, undergoes highlighting land that that uh, you will be utilizing to to plan for and assess your land capacity going forward um, under your your existing zoning. So that's what sort of what this map is showing. What is the land that is expected or could be expected to have a chance to develop or redevelop over the next 20 years? This is for the, the planning horizon of your comprehensive plan. So through 2044. And so the the vacant ones are are sort of self-explanatory. Pending the pink ones are projects that have recently uh, either developed or are under construction or have recently been permitted. So those parcels are sort of have been removed from that buildable lands inventory. Um, and then the redevelopable is based on uh, a number of factors, but primarily looking at land values. Uh, an improvement to land value ratio is one of the major indicators or criteria used, meaning the um, the ratio of the building on on the site compared to the land value um, and then also through coordination with with city staff likely this commission had a chance to chime in um, uh, some parcels could also be included like in this case many of the parcels within the town center area because of the recent upzoning and changes that brought about um, further redevelopment potential there so that's a bit of an explanation just on why these parcels are shown on here. Um, but I wanted to give a chance to the commissioner who asked this question if you wanted further clarification or other questions about this map. Hi, David. Um, I think I, I was the uh, uh, commissioner who wrote the question. And uh, no, I think you explained it uh, perfectly. Um, that uh, pretty much answers my question. Uh, thank you. Excellent. Um, good to hear. Yeah, and this map was sort of presented in the plan in the context of um, the city has very little vacant land. Um, as you can see on here, there's very little of the gray color, and that's sort of your low-hanging fruit for development. So it's driving home the point that any future development um, would like would need to be infill development or, or redevelopment of a property that that already has um, a, an existing structure on it. Um, so the other question I received or comment. So this uh, table here, and I apologize, it's a little bit blurry. Uh, this was uh, showing the results of a, um, a a leakage analysis, basically looking at where do people in Malik Terrace spend their money across various retail categories, uh, and then there's the column current leakage. So today, where are they going? And then future demand um, is taking into account future population uh, growth forecasts for Mount Lake Terrace uh, and applying that to um, these same uh, uh, retail categories in terms of, of potential future spending power and demand to then lead to a, a potential uh, estimated number of new stores uh, within these retail categories that would be, um, that could be expected to be in demand over the next uh, in this case, through 2035, so over the next 10 or so years. Um, so the question here is three auto parts stores correct. There's already one store on the east side of the city, one on the outside of the limits to the north, and auto-oriented businesses are prohibited in the town center. So does this account for town center TOD population growth? Um, so it does account for some population growth, which would uh, account for some of that uh, town center growth, which is where much of the growth is expected to occur. And I'll just, just sort of comment on the, the fact that while there are stores nearby, but they are outside of the, the city limits, would potentially skew some of this analysis a bit because this is assessing just that. Is the money being spent outside the city of Mount Lake Terrace, meaning you're not capturing any of the, um, you know, the tax revenue that, that uh, comes along with that? And so, uh, yes, that 
it is correct, but the there could potentially be a need for a caveat there. Um, however, with future demand or, or growth, uh, could say that there there is an expectation there could be further demand for that within the city limits. Um, any follow up questions on that from um, any of you? Yeah, that that was my comment, um, and I realized after I submitted that that I actually forgot a store to the south as well. So there, I mean, for us, I mean, I understand, you know, what you're saying is that, you know, it's not capturing, you know, those dollars spent outside of our city limits. And I think in this, at least for this category, what caught my eyes just because literally on the other side of the, on the other side of the street is one, you know, it's in Linwood. If it was on the south side of the street, it would be us. And then the, there's an auto parts store to the south right on Ballinger Way, which is, you know, a half a block, maybe a block from the city limits. So, um, plus there's already a auto parts store in, in the town itself. And, um, I'm not even thinking how close there is probably one on 99 as well. So we're, we're, we're completely surrounded by them. And so I was just, I was like, if this is going to help shape, you know, sort of future policy, I'm not sure we necessarily need to try and account for this type of retail activity. Uh, cause we're, we're, I think we're, we're pretty well served in that category, especially because when I when I think of like auto parts stores, um, I don't usually think of auto parts stores in sort of more pedestrian friendly uh, mixed use environments. They tend to be more strip mall auto auto oriented, um, and so that kind of caught my eyes. Like, well, that one we're kind of overserved with those already, and two, the type of development that we you would see those in is, isn't necessarily the type that we're trying to see moving forward. Yeah, and I think that's that's definitely a valid comment. I'll pause in a second just to let other commissioners chime in if they'd like to, but I'll, I'd say that that is somewhat of a limitation of this type of analysis and that this is just sort of providing the, the results of that analysis of where your dollars are going. Um, I think it is up to this commission, up to city council and city leadership on whether or not this shapes your, your policy going forward. I, and I, I think the way at least the strategies are framed in this plan, as well as your economic vitality element, is that it is not the intention of the city to pursue necessarily further auto-oriented types of businesses. Um, but this is maybe just showing where you know, where your dollars are going, where there might be demand. And so then it's up to, up to you all to, to sort of shape your policy to capture the types of, of retail um, that you want to see uh, and so this is noting there's going to be future demand for, you know, for more fast casual restaurants, other health or, or sort of uh, personal goods stores, things like that. And so if that's more within line what the city is hoping to see, which, you know, through stakeholder involvement, that is the case. Um, that's really how we should we should be gearing our strategy and, and policy. I, I will say, though, that, you know, n not trying to diminish that, you know, that is a significant amount of leakage. Um, and obviously we would like people to, you know, spend those dollars in the city. So, you know, I guess it would only raise more questions, you know, as to why, you know, a resident of Mount Lake Terrace maybe would, would travel outside of the city. Is it just because of convenience, you know, because they just happen to be closer to the store that's just outside of our, our boundaries? Or, you know, maybe is it something more simple as they just have a preference for brand and, you know, have always gone to a certain, you know, brand, you know, store X as opposed to store Y. And so it's just always off their radar. So I don't know. It looks like I have a commissioner who has a comment. Go ahead, Commissioner Metric. Thanks, actually, I have two questions. Um, so one, that negative number there with a the full service restaurant, um, how do we interpret that? Are we oversupplied or is that a potential strength that we have? Like, so, yeah, I assume people are coming from outside to visit our full service restaurants. Yes, so so that's what that what that means is that based on the estimated sort of demand within the Mount Lake Terrace population, um, there's more money, twelve over twelve million dollars um, worth of spending at at your full full service restaurants, more than you would expect to come from Mount Lake Terrace Mount Lake Terrace residents themselves. Cool. So I like that. I think that is, uh, you know, if we're a tasty town, maybe that's a good sign for us. Um, the other question I have, I feel like um, 
one of the things I would be really interested to see in is like third places, uh, one of those things that kind of strengthens the community. I think there's sort of a demand need for that kind of thing. And they're not necessarily all captured in retail, like a library could be a third place or a park. But, um, you know, two common ones are cafes and uh, we've got like Hemlock State and some other breweries, bars, things like that. Um, <clears throat> How is that captured in this analysis, and um, is there are there missing categories? So, a good question. Um, that nuance is not necessarily captured in this analysis, at least the numbers that are shown here. Um, you mentioned Hemlock Brewery. That would be captured within, um, I think, most likely within full service restaurant. Um, in terms of third places or sort of activity just being driven to a location or a business, um, there are methods to, and so you can see in the source here, Placer AI, if you're all familiar with that, that data source, it anonymizes cell phone data um, to, to see where people are going. Um, seems a little, a little creepy, but it is completely anonymous. Um, and there are ways to sort of to look at it in, in almost real time. There's a three day lag on on where people have been traveling. So um, that's not an analysis we had conducted as part of this this process. But is, uh, there are ways to sort of track if activity is growing just in, in sheer volume of, of visitations to a place, uh, which might be um, worthwhile to to track going forward. Um, yeah. and I know that is uh, is a goal of the city, of course. Yeah, I do think as we're looking, especially if we're trying to create new neighborhoods or enhance existing neighborhoods, like being able to identify the kinds of uses that like are a little bit intangible, but like to capture in this kind of data. Um, but I think that those uses that sort of build a sense of place would be good. Like you can kind of, you know, squint your eyes a little bit and say, well, maybe for a service restaurant plus clothing stores plus like you know, minus one auto parts store plus like uh, you know healthcare like maybe that equals a vital like sort of the the base minimum unit of like a neighborhood center, but I think um, if there is a way to like capture sort of different categories of things that lead to like something that can be an anchor that then grows the neighborhood, I think that would be valuable. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good point. I think as we probably can all know just an, or think anecdotally, restaurants often, you know, food businesses often drive activity. Um, Malik Terrace obviously has some some good um, news in that regard, just in terms of there are people coming to, to your restaurants. Um, this doesn't show exactly, you know, where those restaurants are located that are driving all of this spending. Um, but the types of, of retail, grocery stores, you know, fast casual or just food-based businesses in general um, are often anchors that then drive further activity to other types of, of retail and clustering them together is sort of when you get that anchor um, of, of activity or sorry, that um, the diversity of activity that, that you are looking for, especially in your town center and then potentially in other neighborhood centers throughout the city. So I think that's, you know, at least I hope that is captured within some of the strategies within this plan. Um, it's maybe something we can try and make a little clearer that that is the intent. It certainly is, is stated clearly within your town center sub area plans. Um, and I think through, you know, through the comprehensive planning process, we've heard that as well and trying to drive that sort of activity um, into into your town center in particular. As, as part of this analysis, is it possible to um, kind of ex extrapolate some of the anonymous data and, you know, obviously it, it can't, you know, give us like point to point, but like break it down by sub areas, like, you know, how much leakage is there in the, you know, from like say the town center to these different categories and where are they going? You know, are they going just right over the line to shoreline? Are they going to Linwood? You know, how far are they going to get these services that in a perfect world we would have in our city for them? Uh, or on the other, you know, kind of the question earlier about the restaurants, can it identify, you know, at least by sub areas, 
I mean, we don't have a lot of full service restaurants, so it doesn't take much to figure out <laughs> where this money's going. But, you know, where this business is coming from, you know, like how, what kind of, I guess, like what kind of regional draw are we in, in some of these categories? Obviously, restaurants, the only one where it looks like we're doing better than everything else. But, you know, where, where are these people coming from? Are, you know, are they, are they our near neighbors? Are people coming from far and wide? You know, like what, what's, what's the distance travel? Like, like what's the draw and where is it coming from? Um, yeah, so that is something that can be analyzed through using Placer AI data. Um, it's not it's not something that has that we've conducted during this planning process, uh, but that that data is available. It's it's a pretty powerful tool. There's different different ways that it can be utilized. So you can um, not I don't believe by by service category, but you could hone in on a specific restaurant or location and see where activity in that location is coming from. Uh, so it, it, that is a, there's some interesting nuance you can begin to dig in there, into there. Um, and, and something that I think, again, as this data becomes more ubiquitous and, and easy to use, um, especially if you have um, your economic development staff uh, on board that, that could utilize something like that, it's something you can track over time as well to see the trends on how that changes. Does anybody else have any questions on this topic? All right. Um, so, so those are actually the only sort of questions or comments that I pulled out from the first few chapters. The rest of the time, I wanted to just go through the strategic framework itself. Um, probably not going word for word through every single one, just for, for time's sake. Um, I'm assuming all of you at least have spent some time with the plan. So I'll go through the comments that were received related to specific items um, and sort of the, the high level um, pieces of it, but then please stop me if there are other comments or, or questions along the way. Uh, and, and for any of the comments, I think that, that were sort of skipped in the earlier part as well, if you feel the, the need to, to raise those up, we can go back to that uh, as well. Um, so this is a slide shared last time, but just to, to reiterate, um, basically after all of our of our planning and sort of review of existing uh, existing and, and previous plans, uh, stakeholder involvement really distilled the the key the goals and strategies down to these three major points. Um, the major the high level goals of building identity, expanding economic diversity, supporting and growing local business, and attracting new business. But then really, how, how does Mount Lake Terrace want to accomplish that? Enhancing the city's image as a destination for business, uh, supporting local and small business as a pillar of Mount Lake Terrace's economy, and investing in Mount Lake Terrace Town Center as a hub for local and regional economic activity. And so that is broken down into right, three core strategies that was just read, 11 objectives underneath those, and then 27 action steps uh, on how to achieve those objectives. And these objectives sort of written in a in an active way of, you know, this, uh, this is what will be achieved um, through this objective. So um, starting off, the first strategy enhancement like Terrace's image as a destination for business branding is something that's been talked about since we first came on board to assist in your comprehensive plan and this this economic strategic planning process. So objective 1.1 here is that city branding and marketing helps to draw new interest from investors businesses and residents. Um, first action under that is to establish and promote a more distinct Mount Lake Terrace brand and identity, um, building on some of the assets that have been identified through this plan, some of the uh, uh, identity um, the themes that were identified as well, uh, a city with access to regional transportation, um, and a city that's embraced a vision for dense, vibrant, and diverse uh, economic and living opportunities. And so then, these further sort of sub actions are some of the stakeholders to involve in this branding. And so the comment here was also, was to also include neighborhoods and saying that the planning commission has been requesting this for years. Uh, so just wanted to see if you wanted to speak to that a little further. Is that something just, just to include the inclusion of, of neighborhoods here? Um, or was this referring more towards specific branding, like um, uh, identities by neighborhood? This is, a, this is a clarifying question there. Probably a little bit of both. Um, part of the goal of us doing these sub areas plans 
that we've been requesting to work on for a long time um, is to build up those those sub area and you know you know commercial center branding and and identity um, you know as well so not only working on you know the city as a whole but also identifying you know trying to really pinpoint you know our certain commercial areas um, for you know attractive growth and, and development as well it's I think it's you know it's it's good to have a, a, you know an overall strategy for the city but you know with different components of the city you know especially being split by the freeway um, we we are kind of different islands and so not you know the people who aren't as familiar with our city you, you know the when you talk about terrace as a whole, that's that's great, but you know we have various parts of the city, you know, that we're trying to highlight as well, and so just you know just calling attention to those as well. So 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 they don't just sort of get lost in the shuffle. Sure. And is um, is our open question to you and other commissioners? Is that something you feel like? Uh, I guess we can, we can sort of mention that they carrying forward some of the identity building that was done in the sub area planning process or um because I, I think what we heard loud and clear definitely through our stakeholder involvement was Mount Lake Terrace just doesn't have an identifiable brand or or identity to many people outside of Mount Lake Terrace and even for people within Mount Lake Terrace for that matter and that's sort of at a citywide level and so sort of what is that defining feature to, feature to sort of to try and put Malik Terrace more on the map regionally is maybe what this is more focused on but then you're right of course within Malik Terrace there are distinct communities or, or neighborhoods with um, different feel and, and identity themselves so maybe just as a an extra sub bullet under this to to make sure that that's not lost in this process as well yeah I think that's fine I don't know if anybody else has any additions Differences, no. I guess I, I would just maybe add, as I understand this, <clears throat> this is more how we talk externally outside of the city. And so maybe if we were getting into the neighborhood specific branding, we might be talking to maybe the wrong, I guess, crowd in that. Because I, I agree, I see where you're going with that, but is, is that necessarily how we speak outside of our community? rather than internally. I see that as kind of an internal discussion, but yeah. it might be hard for us because we don't really have super defined neighborhoods yet yeah. to really be able to put that into, I think, easy to describe language. And I, I would think, you know, kind of like if, you know, you're internal, you're already in the city, you may not, I mean, most people don't even, aren't even, you know, don't even know what our sub areas are named as, let alone that there are sub areas that exist at all. But at least they're familiar with the areas. It's like, oh, you, oh, I know where Cedar Plaza is. Oh, I know where the Safeway is. Or, you know, I know where Town Center is, where there used to be a grocery store. That's usually how, how it's phrased. Um, I think when I think of, you know, that identity, yeah, it's great, you know, internally, but the stronger the identity will help attract outsiders to come into the city, spend their dollars, maybe move here and realize, oh, wow, you're this close to the light rail station? Oh, I want to live here. You know, you know, some thing, you know, things like that. So I, th I think there's, you know, there's a, there could be benefit for it, having that internal discussion, but I've always kind of envi uh, envisioned it as, as being more as a boost to get sort of outside attention and get those people in dollars coming in. All right. Any others on on this first action item? So the second one again, this sort of this whole first objective is about branding and marketing. So um, second action is to refresh the city's online presence. Um, city has a you know a, a, an online economic development web page that does have a good deal of information on there, but I think making it a little more pertinent, up to date, um, perhaps a little more interactive in the way that you can access some of the information. Uh, is is um, a viable tool uh, to promote economic development, make the city, again, feel like an attractive uh, destination for, for businesses or anyone else perusing your website. Um, so some some other options considering including testimonials, um, some, some links here to some local, but also uh, national examples of some good 
uh, economic development websites, and then uh, beyond that, exploring ways to reach into other intended audiences. So through you know articles, um, potentially holding conferences or other events with strategic partners, which some of those partners are, are mentioned further along here. Um, so no comments that were received on that. I'm going to keep moving along unless, again, please stop me if you think there's, um, you have a question or comment on, on this. Uh, objective 1.2, so strengthen local and regional partnerships attract new employment and development opportunities. So this is um, looking more, you know, how, do you, how do you attract business externally to come to, um, to Mount Lake Terrace? So this first one here, uh, action 1.2a, maintain and strengthen the city's relationship with your chamber of commerce as an essential partner in the development and implementation of economic development projects in the city. Um, so a number of sort of uh, sub actions here related to that, um, ending with the possibility of establishing an economic development task force, uh, doesn't have to be named a task force, but uh, a body that is gonna be focused on economic development uh, and together with your chamber, would not have to exclusively be a partnership with the city and your chamber on a task force like this. Um, but a comment here that, yeah, historically a chamber of commerce can be helpful, but also a hindrance um, to, to city goals and policies. Um, so not to allow the chamber to, to sort of solely dictate um, policy for the city. Uh, valid, valid concern for sure. Um, chambers are different in all, in all sorts of jurisdictions. I know that you're current chamber has sort of recently been revitalized um, and some of the, you know, the relationships that are maybe being renewed or strengthened right now seem to be um, a good, as you said, good, there, there's good, good vibes in that partnership in terms of collaboration and working together. But of course, there's different interests in, involved there. So that's where, you know, a working group uh, can help to, to work through some of those differences if they, they do occur. But um, any further comments or questions on that related to the comment here? Well, that was one of my comments. I, I, you know, I think especially given, you know, given the size of the city and seeing how things have, or how transactions have sort of occurred in the past, it's really easy for a few out, you know, outside business elements to try and throw their weight around, um, you know, kind of a big fish in the small pond kind of, kind of scenario. And I mean, I see it, you know, where I work in a larger city, you know, the, the, the trouble sometimes with, you know, chambers of commerce and, and downtown associations, you know, how they, it can, while we want businesses to be successful, their self-interest sometimes goes against, you know, overall city policy, policy and goals. And um, I've always had concerns and will probably always continue to have concerns, you know, about a small, a small representation of this community having an outside, outsized influence. Um, obviously that influence is, is probably direct from the, 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 you know, chamber members, or maybe not even chamber members, but usually directly to council. They, they, they've learned over the years, they don't get very far with us. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a concern. And, you know, I, I think I've made other comments to you in the past is, it, you know, you know, so I might hold some of my other comments until we, until we get to other sections, but, um, I don't know if anybody else has any other comments or, you know, Kind of feelings or stances. It's you know, in this it is it isn't so much of a, you know, oh, add this bullet point or avoid you know, remove this bullet point. I think at the comments more of a, a warning that we should be careful. Might have one additional comment. Um, I do think um, Briar is included in our Chamber of Commerce right now. I think. Whatever organization we reach out to should be focused on Mount Lake Terrace. We don't need scope. I'm concerned about scope creep. If we start getting outside organizations or organizations that represent the outside things involved, I know they've like you know expanded a bit, and that's probably a good move for them. But like you know, I want to make sure we're not stepping on Briar's toes, and Briar also is not like you know 
influencing what we're having unless we're, you know, specifically requesting it. Um, I think Commissioner Harrison has their hand raised, or I'm sorry, that chair you sh should be calling on <laughs> speakers. <laughs> Apologies. Yeah, Commissioner Harrison. Oh, sure. Um, I'm not sure if this is the most current information, uh, information, but I had heard that the the joint Briar Mount Lake Terrace um, Chamber of Commerce split again a few months back. So the the uh, Briar is no longer part of it. But I don't know. Staff might be able to clarify um, a little more on that. I I I'd heard my, I heard a few different uh, messages, but um, to my knowledge, I believe they're separate again. But um, please, someone you know. Jump in and correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. That that's my understanding. Um, I know the the chamber has been rebranded as solely the Mount Lake Terrace Chamber of Commerce. I, that that happened just within the last couple of months. Uh, but yeah, staff, if you have further clarification on that, please. That's correct. I missed that. Me too. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. All right. Um, so next action i'm here initiate and maintain regular communication with the economic alliance of snohomish county so this is your you know, your regional uh economic development partner within the county um they especially for a smaller jurisdiction like Mali terrace it's incredibly important to tap into these types of partnerships and really that's that's how economic development works um so you know in, in doing all of this in a vacuum as as a city that you won't get very far but um you know working on for potential development sites, communicating that clearly to the Economic Alliance of Sonomish County and the partners that you can connect with through them, um, some of the areas that are targeted for development uh, within the city, working to establish criteria for the, you know, the types of businesses and industry that you want to bring into these areas a little more clearly. I think that we, we've heard a lot about wanting to, to drive activity in the town center, um, drive drive further growth. A lot of talk around, around housing and sort of how that can drive retail growth. But I think there's still work to be done as a, as a city to, to sort of think more clearly about the types of businesses and maybe criteria that come along with that. Um, and then proactively working with your, your partners at the, the Alliance to maybe bring other people, conduct city tours, um, working with brokers, and others to sort of get your brand out there again. So this is thinking more externally, um, highlight the amenities, the uh, the potential here uh, in the city. So there wasn't a comment about that, but that's that's that action. Um, or actually, I'm sorry, I think this comment was related to, to that action item. So redevelopment as well um, within the areas built near light rail stations, as well as future desired station locations. So I'm, I think that's that's related to um, kind of just the targeted areas that uh, that you should be highlighting through these partnerships. Um, yeah, just to, just another. Um, on that? Yeah, just yeah, just to sort of you know add that somewhere as well. Uh, you know, obviously, town center Melody, uh, town center has already got a light rail station. Um, we wish there was one at Melody Hill, maybe pie in the sky dream in the future that there'd be one there, but Melody Hill being an area that potentially could see redevelopment in terms of uh, not only mixed use, but maybe some reimagining of the light industrial area, maybe transitioning to some life sciences or, you know, something in the future. Um, you know, the, the fact that uh, potentially, you know, we can't over promise, but you know, that there could be a light rail station there in the future, uh, you know, I think would be an important selling point um, for that neighborhood and not to forget how close our northern part of the city is to the Linwood light rail station as well. That sometimes gets overlooked. Yes, I think that was noted on, on another comment here. Um, but yes, that that's a good a good point. I mean, bo both uh, proximity to Linwood as well as the potential future light rail station there. Um, so next action, action 1.2C, initiating cross-jurisdictional partnerships. So this is something that um, that we heard through our discussions with council um, that, uh, as well as others highlighting that, again, partnerships being so key to economic development um, in your South Snohomish County, North King County uh, 
area here, there's potential for collaboration. We're working together with your partners just um, just across the border in, in Shoreline. Um, they have a lot of the same sort of challenges and questions in their economic development initiatives. Um, there's a lot of potential there to, to partner with uh, nearby jurisdictions. And this is talking about the, exploring the possibility of establishing sort of an official economic development partnership. That's something you see throughout the region as well, these sort of sub uh, regional economic development partnerships to help uh, program event days, drive workforce development, um, talk about uh, you know, markets, other sorts of um, things that can can highlight your your existing businesses, et cetera. I have one comment that I think has <clears throat> came to mind through this discussion, and I can always add it in a comment unless now is the time for comments. Um, but if it is, what I Please. think might be interesting is also including some information about like teaming up with Shoreline Community College and Edmonds Community College as ways to not only promote businesses, but they may be future tenants. They may provide, you know, um, resources that we're talking about here. So I think including them somewhere, maybe in 1.2, it makes sense or one point. I think 1.2 B or C. I think we might have a section further on that kind of touches on that. I know because I made a comment oh, on that. So okay. Yeah, I believe they they are included in in one of the the further actions um, here. Okay. Because yeah, we're we seem like a great location for if they ever need to expand their <laughs> their college to uh, you know talk with us and we'll have the space. Absolutely. Um. All right, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep moving just in case or please jump in, yeah, if there's other questions. Um so related a bit to, to what um the chair just said, uh, Melody Hill maintains the employment focus while evolving to meet the needs of the regional economy. So um understanding that Melody Hill is where your only existing light industrial um zoning exists, uh is you know, it is a rarity within Mount Lake Terrace. And so uh, there's been discussion through the comprehensive planning process of rezoning areas of that. I think the, the conclusion for the most part is to maintain it as an employment focused area, but look into ways to, um, to, to support the evolution of that over time. Most of those, those uh, current businesses are still operating. There's not a lot of vacancy once again, um, uh, but consider Ways to adjust your zoning, as well as uh, through partnerships, look into you know working with with property owners, potential developers, site selectors uh, to identify areas for redevelopment, and even as was mentioned, possible uh, life sciences conversions uh, or maker incubator space conversions of some of the older uh, properties in the area. Um, and then also within that area, Action 1.3B, maintaining a strong relationship with Primera Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, to help support it. It is your largest employer um, by by far. And so um, doing the best, like sort of uh, the city's best effort to to be a good partner to to them um, to maintain that, that employment base is an important part of the strategy as well. Um, objective 1.4. Increased housing diversity and supply supports the city's existing and future workforce. So a lot of uh, work done around housing through the comprehensive planning process. So I don't know that I need to um, focus on this too much, but housing really does make a major difference when it comes to economic development. One of the, the key findings from the analysis in this and through our stakeholder involvement, um, and really this is just a regional issue, um, the lack of housing um, in certain areas can be a detriment to finding employees to, to um, uh, for businesses finding employees that want to live close to their to their job, um, Malik Terrace has an opportunity to increase housing. Uh, it's a relatively affordable place to live within the region. Um, that can that can be a strategic advantage when it comes to attracting employers and future residents as well. Um, so a number of, of strategies there that are, are in alignment with the comprehensive planning uh, work uh, around housing to support future uh, housing development and growth. Looks like I got a commissioner with a question, uh, Commissioner Betcher. Uh, yes, thanks. Um, how much do you find these two items to be in potential conflict? Um, like in Linwood, we've seen a lot of strip malls get redeveloped into apartment complexes and the strip malls are sort of like these 
you know, dead places, but they're also like, you know, very cheap places for new businesses to locate with those being replaced with apartments and very little like business space. Um, that is a concern I've been seeing locally and I'm curious if you have any thoughts as to how these can be balanced or if you have any metrics you'd recommend or any comment on sort of if these two are in conflict, um, sort of how do we either avoid conflict or optimize for one or the other? A, a good question. Um, I think, I mean, one of the sort of simplistic answers is, um, you know, rooftops drive retail. Um, if you're looking to, to have an active retail core, especially within your town center, um, Bell Lake Terrace is, is already a relatively dense city, but just in terms of a, uh, a further density of activity in households within particularly your town center can help to drive that sort of retail growth. Within your, your town center zoning, there are requirements around ground floor commercial. So um, you know, as further housing is developed, there will be retail spaces that become, become available. Um, there, there are some challenges there around affordable commercial spaces, of course, and new development, new um, podium style or mixed use development, not always the most affordable. So I think there are you know, further along uh, in these these actions or objectives, there are some strategies around keeping commercial space affordable or some things the city could do to support the provision of affordable commercial space. Um, some of that could be you know, directly in a mixed use building. Some of it could be promoting more micro retail style development um, in certain locations. You know, just because you have a, a town center that's promoting density doesn't mean that all of it um, needs to or will become mid-rise podium style development immediately in the short term. And so more affordable types of commercial space can also in turn drive desirable a, a desirable location that can lead to further housing development and, and other activities. So um, yeah, it's it's uh, sometimes a bit of a chicken and egg problem, but there are strategies I think that are located in this 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 plan that do speak to that. Um, but it also requires being, I think, nimble and, and sort of flexible in, in the way that you allow development um, in your city um, and allowing sort of creativity and in, in the types of commercial spaces that you're you're looking for. A strip commercial um, mall doesn't necessarily isn't a negative, especially as you mentioned, it can be affordable. There are ways those spaces can even be revitalized and reused to create some some interesting um, newer types of commercial development too. So I hope that answers your question. It does. Um, I'm thinking of in specifically downtown Bothell, they've got that little strip of like, it's like tiny houses, but they're businesses. It's like on this vacant lot. Like, I think there's, you know, as we're changing, there's a lot of opportunity for these kind of things. And I'm glad you said that because I think uh, we'll probably need to be looking to things like that. Um, and um, I think that would be fantastic if we had, you know, robust examples of that and ways to accommodate that. Absolutely. And I think um, as I was reviewing this, this for today's meeting, I actually thought of a couple of other examples that I had not included or we had not been included in this plan, um, which we'll make sure get get included for the final version. Um, some good examples to, to look to beyond what's already been included I think, in the plan. So um, I will say there's this one other comment, just we'll need to clarification for walking distance. Recognize that is vastly different depending on age accessibility. Um, so that is uh, related to the second bullet point here, um, including middle housing and a diversity of housing options within walking distance of designated commercial centers and transit. So I think, yeah, we, uh, is it just a matter of reframing the um, sort of the wording of that to ensure that it's uh, accessible, maybe is the better word uh, or way to frame that? Yeah, that was one of my comments. You know, I'm not sure if, you know, be re you know, a rephrasing or not. I, I like to bring that up a lot of times when we see this because, you know, as people, you know, in the planning profession or who are planning adjacent, you know, we see the term a lot. So we kind of have an eye, you know, we just have this sort of instincts like, oh, okay, well, the standard, you know, the standard walking distance is analyzed at this and is at that. But it, it in in reality, it, it, it does make a difference depending on what your um, 
personal circumstances are, and it, it, you'd be surprised how many people, you know, we think, oh, walking distance is a half mile, quarter mile. You'd be surprised how many people can't do that. And so it's uh, it just, uh, you know, maybe just something to remember. And I know, I know, you know, maybe not here, but uh, probably in our code or somewhere else, it might provide a little bit more detail. But the, the other reason why I bring that up is that when we talk about middle housing, you know, it's a certain type of development versus more dense housing, but we may want that dense housing all within that core walking distance um, and maybe middle housing needs to be a little bit more on the periphery but you know it's just you know it's something to think about and to consider the other thing is that you have to be a little bit more mindful at least in mount lake terraces depending on what part of the city we're talking about too there's a lot of hills and hills can impact yeah. how far somebody can can uh can walk or wants to walk uh, as well, so it's it's, a, it's there's a little bit more dynamic conditions uh, going on. So it's just uh, I know, and I know this you know these bullet points aren't meant uh, you know just sort of be a blanket statement. I, I always like to you know throw that in, so you know kind of makes us think a little bit harder on some of these things. Yeah, it's it's an important thing to to continue to um, to harp on and, and bring up. So we could, I can, we can include some of that in here as well. But I think just in general, your your statement that we need to be thinking about that in general in terms of housing placement um, in the city. So agreed. Um, so moving on, I want to just make sure we're. You now there's other agenda items after us, so I'll, I'll sort of move a little quickly to to where we have the other comments. Um, but this objective here is talking about really empowering staff and the need for a dedicated economic development um, uh, staff member uh, to, to help execute this plan because ultimately uh, that's that will that's what will be necessary to really make economic development a focus of the city um, so there weren't any comments on that I know we've talked about this previously uh, I guess so my only, on... my only comment oh. on that would be and maybe this is a question for staff is one enough Or should it should it be more? Or I think once a start, a start. <laughs> there we go. Okay. And it's not to say I know the city has, you know, community and economic development staff that are doing great work, but someone who's specifically focused on economic development, which is something you see in, in many of your your neighboring jurisdictions, right? Um, and could could grow into. To more as the need is um, is established. So strategy two, support local and small business as a pillar of the economy. Um, so there were no comments on this page. I think um, by and large, this is was really a, one of the driving forces of this planning process that sort of came out very loud and clear. A lot of these recommendations were um, developed in coordination with your local business community, um, as, as well as other members of, of the, the community. Um, so some strategies here about how to basically make the city more friendly to small business, establishing a one-stop business center, um, and then uh, continuing to partner with your chamber and other business groups uh, or government agencies to identify the needs and create resources to meet those needs. So um, there were many members of your chamber that that said they'd be, be um, enthusiastic about working with the city on developing some of these resources um, to whether it's through your website or through um, activities that are in person as well. Um, so tapping into that, I think, is is vital. Um, but other partners, uh, Washington Small Business Development Center, um, SCORE, there are others mentioned um, later on in this section here as well. Um, so can, can you just clarify real quick? Here, um, Objective 2.2 and the actions underneath it. These are speaking towards um, ways to make affordable commercial space uh, or commercial space more affordable um, to local and small businesses in Mount Lake Terrace. Um, so some updates to the town center zoning to incentivize provision of ground floor commercial space that targets local businesses, shared workspaces, um, second, second floor commercial spaces. Um, so some strategies around how to accomplish that and, and potentially working to provide smaller spaces, which just inherently will be more affordable. Um, this is something we heard very clearly from members of the chamber as well, that 
um, smaller commercial spaces, micro retail types of spaces um, are often what are most in demand. Um, comment here though, um, though no current demand commercial use beyond the first two floors should also be considered. So I think, yes, that, that is valid. Just noted they're not, um, no current demand, uh, or it's, it's difficult to, to state that there's, there's demand for that today. Um, but I think your zoning is in place that uh, it would be viable. Um, our buildings can be built for um, for office or or more vertical commercial style development, most certainly. Um, but did you have a, a further comment or, or want to speak to that comment at all? No, not not, not necessarily to that that comment. Um, as I know that's something that we've talked about. You know, we were trying to push even second floor commercial development for a while. You know, the idea was. Ground floor would be more, you know, retail. Second floor would be more sort of an office, medical type uh, uh, businesses. Um, pie in the sky, the demand is so high, you know, we would need <laughs> another floor for commercial or, or, or maybe just flat out see, you know, uh, you know, a commercial building, you know, in our town center that, you know, isn't mixed use because there, there would be so much demand. But, you know, that's far on the future. I just wanted to circle back real quick on the, on the previous slide. Um, at the bottom in your bulletin, kind of the agencies, you, 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 you have SCORE there. To me, given my background, SCORE, I think of the South County Jail. So what is, what is SCORE real quick? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, it's a, it is a, a national small business support um, agency uh, that has local uh, entities throughout, throughout the nation um, and is, um, is uh, related to the, the Small Business Association. Okay, cool. Thanks. I can I can clarify that acronym though uh, acronym uh, there. Any other comments on on this here? Um, Action two point two, sort of furthering this this objective, utilizing development agreements and negotiate a portion of new commercial space be provided as affordable commercial and or for local businesses. Something that we've seen utilized in in other parts of the region. Um, Let's see. And um, yeah, relevant to, to Action 2.3C, which will be mentioned here in a moment. Um, Check 2.3, Mount Lake Terrace operates with a spirit of entrepreneurship to encourage new business startups as a pillar of its local economy. So more about the, the culture of supporting new business and activities that can be done to do so. So um, this Action 2.3A, approve upon business registration and licensing process for home-based businesses. Um, many of your businesses are home-based businesses, and so ensuring that process is as um, as clear and simple and smooth as process as possible uh, is a is an important strategy uh, and thing to be reminded of. Um, comment here about requiring will require more discussion, possible issues with setbacks and generated trips. Um, I'm assuming this is related to the accessory commercial units down here in the bottom bullet. Yeah, that that was mine. So pretty simple. Straightforward, but I think we got a, another commissioner comment here. Yep. Um, yeah, I think maybe the this director two point three kind of addresses my comment a little bit, but I just wanted to maybe talk a little bit about you use the term micro retail before, and I think it's been pinging around in my head, and um, just how we can look at our our zoning regulations to yeah explore that allowance of more neighborhood business uses that can be affordable and not just, you know, the very classic ground floor retail commercial uses. Um, and so I, I guess, yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering if we can consider like what kind of regulations that we can look at to help, you know, infiltrate those in our neighborhoods to make walking distance less, to make things more affordable for businesses where there can be, uh, you know, a small neighborhood coffee shop on a corner that you know that neighborhood would be utilizing, but it's not necessarily in a major commercial center. Yeah, well, especially when we're talking about neighborhood retail like that, neighborhood commercial. Um, oftentimes, it's it's just a matter of allowing it to happen, maybe allowing existing residential building to be turned into a commercial space, um, allowing for yeah, small scale. Um, storefronts to be, be established within your neighborhood, um, maybe with, with a radius in terms of the density of those types of businesses, um, in terms of how many can be allowed within a certain distance of each other. Um, 
there, there are also strategies, as, as mentioned here, in terms of maybe incentives or fee, fee reductions uh, related to the provision of, of smaller commercial spaces within new development. Uh, and then there, there are sometimes, um, there are examples of, of ground up micro retail type developments as well, where you can see maybe a larger building that is purpose built with, with smaller um, commercial spaces in mind. Um, that have proven to be viable in certain locations, and so ensuring that your that your zoning allows that type of development um, as well, and maybe that parking requirements are not um, hindering the possibility of that. Oftentimes, parking requirement will be based on per business um, or square square feet of of a type of business, um, so that can often be a major barrier to that type of development as well. Um, I don't know. I hope that answered your question or, or sort of. Yeah, I don't know if it was a question, comment. but more of just a comment. I'm, and maybe it's getting like too far into the weeds. I mean, this plan is definitely to like, I think maybe just like help us build a foundation here. And maybe that's something we would explore after we get staff on and we have a lot more time to dig into that. Um, and so maybe I'm just like thinking too far down the road. Um, but it's just something, you know, to consider with um, an objective or an, an action we could take. Mm hmm Absolutely. Um, action 2.3B, so partnering with your local schools and regional institutions to support workforce and training, business training programs. So this is more workforce development related. Um, so this is where uh, Workforce Nahomish, one of your regional workforce development partners is mentioned, as well as um, the community colleges that were mentioned before, um, University of Washington. Um, and then a comment here about the the Evergreen Elementary site that had been suggested as a maybe a site for a branch or satellite campus for one of these institutions, um, excuse me, as well. Um, is, is there is maybe a desire to to include that here? Mention of that within the within this plan? Um, not so much as it, as it's written. The um, since most of the planning commissioners are new. Um, the original code kind of predates them is that when we rezoned the elementary school site, uh, originally we were allowing much taller buildings uh, with the hope that it would be more office park or not office park, but office, you know, multi-story office buildings there, you know, thinking that given the proximity to the light rail, that would be a, a really good attraction. And a lot of the, you know, some of that discussion uh, revolved around reaching out and trying to make it like a branch campus or a satellite campus. Um, we were primarily thinking of Edmonds Community College at the time, but, you know, even, you know, like the University of Washington, we figured that Shoreline would probably want to be, you know, near Shoreline's light rail station and Cascadia, which was still fairly new at that time, would probably want to be over in Bothell. But there was, there, we saw the benefit of having some sort of continuing education or satellite branch campus there and the, you know, the how there might be a desire for that. Obviously, the, that those sites redeveloped um, just as um, more of a TOD uh, mixed use buildings. But given that there is still potential redevelopment opportunities within the town center, really close to the um, the light rail station, I think um, have you know having this goal in mind is is important and it had been a goal in the past and you know let's let's you know definitely you know keep keep it on the books and you know hopefully there 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 would be some interest because i think there there'd be a benefit to not only the city's residents but you know re, you know regional residents who take advantage of that schooling itself so kind of going back to 1.2 or 1.3 i think there's we're looking at two different contexts here because I, I oh. see this as as maybe um, well I, I think your comment mm -hmm. that's on there is in line with my comment that was on 1.2 and 1.3 mm -hmm. um, where we're trying to attract yeah. the businesses physically mm -hmm. or, or these organizations physically whereas I, I think as I understood what was what we were just reading was more of teaming with these organizations to develop programs and i guess I'm, I'm looking at programs differently than actually how do we reach out to these organizations and say hey what can we do to get you to set up a satellite office here 
hmm. I guess. And so, so that's why I guess I, I think it would still be important to add some of that into this 1.2 because I think we're talking more about how we create development in partnership with those organizations, whereas I think what we were looking at in 2.4 was more of programmatic development. Unless I'm misunderstanding that, but I think it'd be no, that, that's, important that's a good for point. context. I, think I was going to say, uh, including some some additional text around the possibility of a satellite campus or or bringing those partners to um, to to Montlake Terrace, I think could exist in, in maybe either one of those areas. Uh, your point to to add it to this section, though, I think is a good one. Um, and again, if we think about this as sort of your your roadmap or your your to do list for your existing and potential future economic development staff, making sure it's it's documented in there is, is important. So all right. Um we're on to this one. So um moving right along. So Action 2.3 here, or 2.3C, sorry, exploring the feasibility of a Malik Terrace incubator program. I know this was brought up during our, our discussion on the, the economic vitality element. I think a lot of those comments were incorporated here as well as some of our discussion with your, your local business community around how could the city support that um, further, further sort of entrepreneurial support um, through partnerships there, uh, that have already been mentioned, but then uh, this is another strategy around the possible uh, provision of more affordable space or incubator space. Um, some examples here uh, to look to um, other partners in the region to connect businesses to um, to finance and capital. Uh, so that's often a major challenge for, for local businesses. Um, and then again, some of the existing entrepreneurial programs that exist at, at local community colleges and otherwise um, that could be tapped into uh, or provide better avenues towards um, and resources to access those uh, here within the city. Um, 2.3D, uh, consider developing a small business loan program. This is something that's been brought up. Again, financing being a, a major challenge. Um, there's some successful examples of that uh, within the region. Tacoma small business loan program is pointed out here as a way to, again, drive that sort of local entrepreneurial growth uh, within the city. Um, so the final strategy, and I'll, I'll do just a, a few slides here, um, not too many comments on it, um, but investing in Mount Lake Terrace's town center as a hub for local and regional economic activity. So I know, as we mentioned before, while the, the comprehensive plan is looking a little broader, more long-term, so bringing in more of a focus on your other neighborhood centers, um, and then in the near term, I think it makes sense for the town center to be the major focus in terms of placemaking and, and um, area development. Um, so there's a, a, still a major push for infrastructure investment to, to uh, implement the vision from the town center sub area plan. So that's noted here um, to continue working through that. Um, exploring the feasibility, feasibility, excuse me, of a tax increment financing district to support um, future public infrastructure investment. Um, some nuances within Washington's TIF program, but things that have been changed recently that do make it um, slightly easier and more flexible to, to uh, utilize TIF funds towards infrastructure and other um, uh, place-based uh, improvements. Um, and then action 3.1C, explore the potential use of a graduated density zoning that allows higher densities on larger sites to incentivize the assembly of numerous small parcels with fragmented ownership. So this is a strategy that was included because there's been a lot of discussion around um, the uh, challenges of, of uh, parcelization within the town center. Uh, I think these are the last couple, the last two comments received, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but objective 3.2, a walkable and accessible town center that is connected to Mount Lake Terrace Station fosters a desirable location for business employees and residents. So um, speaking towards, again, some of the, the types of um, amenities that should be provided. Some of this is infrastructure related, but non-motorized connections between sound center, town center and calling out um, the other uh, sort of the network of connections that is um, being pursued currently. Uh, within the city and the importance of that to economic development. 
um, developing city branded wayfinding, especially around your light rail and to your town center, something that was brought up by, by your local business community as well. Uh, prioritizing a sense of safety and security along the street through enhanced lighting, emergency button kiosks. Again, this can lead, uh, sort of be associated with your branding and wayfinding and that, that uh, can be integrated with your identity building as well. Uh, and then ensuring adequate multimodal access and parking within the town center. Now there's, there are a lot of discussion around parking as there always is. Um, and so I think the, the comment here around a connection to the Linwood light rail station was already mentioned. And I think that's, yeah, uh, we can we can include that here and then the this one here around shared structured parking needs to be a part of future redevelopment um not new al along the edge so i uh is that just a comment to to ensure that that's sort of noted here that we're we're talking about structured parking potentially a shared structured parking facility yeah i made both of those comments first apologies for the typo on the first one i know how to spell linwood <laughs> <laughs> embarrassing um the yeah the second one really is you know it's something that i know the planning commission has sort of brought up in the past too you know we we see shared parking uh examples you know one you know thornton creek and in, in in northgate you know the old vital milk site in green lake and you know those are those are two um two large lot developments that have shared parking um i think would be more appropriate for examples for our town center as opposed to how like West Seattle right off of California you know the business owners went and bought together bought a lot but it's a surface lot I don't you know we don't want surface lots in the town center um, but we do recognize the need to maybe have some sort of shared parking strategy so just throwing that comment in there is like if you know yes we are for some sort of strategy for shared parking but it needs to be structured it it, it, it can't be a lot and we would want that shared parking probably in the heart of the action, as opposed to being out on the periphery, where you know might be easier to aggregate some of that property for like a lot. But then you got parking out in the edge where nobody's going to want to park there anyway. Commissioner Metro, um, I feel like I would actually need to see um, proposals of this before I recommended one way or the other, because I could imagine where. Putting parking sort of more distributed on the edge of the town center and then keeping the heart of it sort of more car free, kind of like a mall would be beneficial. Um, I don't know if I would necessarily, but I think like, you know, we're it, like, I can imagine a bunch of things, but I don't know if I would feel comfortable like recommending one strategy or the other first without kind of seeing what is being proposed. I feel like, you know, this comment about like shared parking aggregate in the town center has always has been you know going on for a while but it's always been very vague like i would be interested to see more like i would first off i would be interested to see more concrete suggestions i think um and then um once we have those concrete suggestions like um i think then we can sort of comment on you know does one strategy work better for the other like we probably have more information but if I understand your comment correctly, you're suggesting that, like, maybe I'm misunder misunderstanding your comment, but I think um, what it sounds like you're saying is you're putting the, you're, you're saying don't put the parking on the edge of town center. Yeah, and I guess even when I was making the comment, I had, I, you know, in my mind, I, you know, I'm thinking, okay, uh, how big of parking are we talking about and, you know, how far away is the edge from where, you know, the heart of the action is going to be? Because, you know, if it's only like one block away, that's not that big of a deal. But if it's like, oh, on the edge and then there's sort of creep and it ends up being, you know, town center adjacent, that might be a little bit more, you know, inappropriate one because I think there are some parts of town center adjacent that I think should still be part of the town center, to be honest. But two, there, you know, just unfortunately, though we're trying to create a, you know, a very pedestrian oriented, you know, sort of forward thinking uh town center habits are hard to break and a lot of people still want to be able to park really close to where they're you know where they're going and you know uh commercial businesses want to be able to have their parking really close to where their businesses are so um you know i'm not opposed to it not being you know right in the heart just I think I think you're right. We would it definitely would require some more some more thought, some more discussion, and actually see you know some proposals and how it'd be enacted. The other thing, 
while I was writing that comment, I realized that, you know, any kind of shared parking structure, you know, is a larger parking structure. And, you know, how many lots do we have that potentially could house such a stru structure that's easy, you know, can either easily be aggregated or already is that size. And of course, to me, the biggest lot is <laughs> sort of our super block. It's already, you know, it's already kind of there. Even, even when the 57th Street goes through there, you still got, you know, one half, two halves, you know, there's more possibility for that kind of structure to be built there as opposed to it might be, you know, a bigger lift in, you know, other parts of the town center. But again, you know, somebody is able to put those parcels together and put together a proposal, you know. Yeah, and I think there's also a competing option where you have parking that's more of like distributed so you're not creating that point load peak demand on the transportation network at a single point, sort of like we've got at the big parking garage at the transit center and then you've got all the stoplights there and all the buses and so it's just like this point of congestion but instead you have like smaller things that are sort of more evenly distributed throughout and yeah. so i think like there's just too many options there where i think it needs a lot more like discussion on yeah i i analysis. agree and i think the develop you know any kind of future development that's all going to have to have parking anyway so you're going to see that you know localized per building parking and i'm sure pie in the sky you know we get nicely built out and we have a lot of businesses to go from you know the goal is hey you park once in the first building you're going to and then you just kind of walk everywhere else now they may say hey parking for customers only and you know if they're really going to monitor that and say no no you walked off of our property you got to move your car well that you know that again there that that kind of defeats the purpose but again i agree you know it probably will take some you know future discussion and to to figure it out but i do definitely you know it's a concept the, the Planning Commission has talked about before, and I'm sure, you know, it sounds like the, uh, you know, the businesses are, you know, interested in something like that as well, so. I'm looking forward to the day when this shows up on our agenda. Yeah. I feel like there's a lot of options here, a lot of potential, but, mm -hmm. you know, we've been kind of hinting at it for a while, so. Well, this first billet here, study and explore strategies, it, it could be more direct in, um, you know, explore, uh, the development of a parking, a shared parking strategy or a parking strategy for your town center. Um, and that could be something that, that becomes, you know, an item uh, on your on your future agenda, as you, as you mentioned. Any other comments on this? I think we're, we're near in the end of these strategies now. I'm not hearing or seeing anything, so I think we're good to move on. <laughs> Great. Um, so no comments on this one, but uh, just say Malik Terrace's town center uh, is a vibrant hub of citywide events that promote food, arts, and entertainment. So leaning into, again, some of the success you've had in the, in the food um, related, within your food related businesses, uh, that has been called out as, a, as uh, a, a part of your, your identity, especially within your town center area. Um, so a lot of talk are just around potential programming, um, events, ways to promote existing businesses and drive future business growth related to food, arts, and entertainment. And so this is a series of recommendations related to that um, and some examples of ways to uh, ways to explore that or that have been seen within the region. So um, again, partnering with your, your chamber to on some events, um, other partnerships, uh, and then potential I think there's there's not a viability for this today, but in the future, if there's a critical mass of business, exploring the creation of a, of a business improvement district to drive future or, or further um, development of these sorts of programming and uh, and sort of quality placemaking and investments in your in your town center. So uh, I I have two quick questions. So yeah, that is the that's the last of these uh, objectives and actions. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just because I had two quick comments on that one. Um, I would just add, that, you know, the in terms of you know art in the public place and in, in being incorporated into private projects, that you know, is something that the planning commission has been advocating for for a very long time, um, to the point where you know, even ex you know, do we want to explore, you know, maybe bonus density, you know, if they provide that kind of stuff. So you know, those are conversations that we've had in the past with the with the business improvement district. Again, I think it kind of, you know, it kind of teeters on. Um, where we want 
you know, kind of the resources to, you know, be spent and who, you know, who maintains control over that. I think given, you know, the size of our city right now, I don't know if necessarily we need a, an outside business improvement district being in charge of safety and cleaning of our, of our town center. Um, yeah, I'll be, you know, some, you know, if they want to, you know, partner with the city and you know, on programming events, um, uh, that'd be, you know, that'd be great, but, you know, Placemaking occurs through private development and, you know, what our code allows and, you know, what we can in encourage. But it's, you know, I, I think on some of those stuff, you know, at least right now, I don't, I don't see why the city needs to relinquish their responsibility for um, maintaining some of those services. Yeah, I think this is definitely a, a future action item and it, that sort of leads into the, the last slide, which is about sort of the, the um, temporal nature of these actions. Not wouldn't make sense today, but potentially in the future, um, five, ten, even longer uh, years in the future, as there's a sort of a critical mass of of local businesses, may make sense eventually for the city to to relinquish some of those responsibilities, or for the city that businesses may want to take on more of that responsibility themselves. Um, but so I agree. Today, um, it, it wouldn't make sense to to form a, a business improvement district. Um, so on that note, so there, the last part of the plan is this action matrix. So sort of all of those objectives and actions are listed in here based on these timeframes and recommended timeframes. Um, one of the comments here was just the inclusion of the planning commission as a partner, potential partner on a number of these, uh, which yes, of course, that was sort of a, an oversight or maybe considered that it's uh, inferred, but it should be made more explicit as especially on a couple of these items. Um, and uh, I would say for our preparation for our next meeting on the 26th, it'd be great if there's any specific feedback on this matrix. If we didn't have a, a chance, there weren't any comments on it, and we didn't have a chance to sort of get into this in detail tonight. Um, so look forward to further conversations on that. And um, yeah, that's that's the end of the presentation. Thank you for all the, the great discussion and comments. Uh, they'll be integrated into uh, the next version or draft of this plan. And then with final comments or further comments next time, assuming that is the, the final round of comments, those will be integrated into, again, a uh, uh, not a final draft, but the recommended draft to bring to council um, for the next stages of this plan. Any any last comments or questions before I hand it back over to Jonathan and, and staff? I am not hearing or seeing anything. Uh, let me just double check one more time with our online commissioners. Um, do you guys have any additional comments, questions? Uh, nothing from me. All right. All right. I, th I think we're good then. Alexa, thank you for all your time. I know we went a bit long, um, but I think it was, it was worth it. A lot of great feedback. So I uh, appreciate it. And uh, I will see you on the 26th. Excellent. Thank you. And before we go to the next agenda item, I see my part of the packet is a little thick for this as well. I just want to double check. Is, is everybody good? Just moving to the straight to the item or do people need five minutes real quick to maybe run to the bathroom or stretch their legs? Yes, you're, you're good. Good. You're fine. All right. Everyone wants to keep going, so we're keeping on going. So, so this is going to be draft comprehensive plan review. All right, good evening. Uh, Chair Batista, Vice Chair Harrison, members of the Plan Commission. Um, today we are continuing our draft comprehensive plan review with Planning Commission, specifically going over four of the draft element sections that you should have been given in your packets today. Um, share my screen. Um, so the goal of today is to go over those four element chapters. So with the environment element, recreation parks and open space, housing, economic and economic vitality. Um, so as you recall, on July 8th, we distributed a draft um, condensed matrix of all the element goals and policies um, that you provided comments on. We received those. And so the element chapters have those comments addressed. Um, so it's an opportunity for you to review the elements as they're taking shape in their narrative form um, before we present a more final version of those. Um, 
prior to the September 9th public hearing. So, and sorry, I'm with Mandy Roberts from OTAC Consulting. Good evening. <laughs> um, okay, so just a quick note. I um, did want to mention that staff have been really full speed ahead on preparing the draft EIS that we published on August 1st. Today we had our public meeting and we're accepting public comment until August 30th. So that full document can be found on our Vision 2044 webpage. Um, we've also began to put together the draft comprehensive plan, which we'll be getting to you shortly. So um, in terms of the first element that I wanted to go over is the environment element. So um, for comments that we received from the Planning Commission, some of the changes that were addressed in the narrative is establishing that intent. Um, so really focusing in on creating a climate action plan. Um, we've also addressed some of the tree code ordinance updates that we've done in the, in the past year. So specifically referencing the heritage tree program. Um, in terms of implementation strategies, so you'll see in those draft element sections, um, there's a flow to it, which includes a purpose statement, introduction section, uh, sort of like a contextual statement, goals and policies, and then implementation, which are some of the strategies that we are pursuing or proposing um, for council approval. So for environment element, uh, the first implementation strategy that we refine is to create a climate action plan. Secondly, develop the urban forestry management plan, um, which we're actually starting. So Laura Reed, a, a stormwater manager, is starting that process right now. And you'll believe outside in the hall, there's um, some pamphlets that you can find on that process. Um, Thirdly, increase education of public on key environmental issues and hazardous materials. So one of the key themes that we've heard throughout the elements is the importance of public education, ensuring that there's adequate information available to members of our community on matters such as the environment. Um, yeah. And then specific to goals and policies, so there was comment from Planning Commission, one of the comments was request to, for specific reference to urban heat island effect. Um, in terms of the initiatives, so I believe that's referring to um, goal E and three uh, for climate and environmental protections. So um, the importance of collaborating with local jurisdictions, regional jurisdictions, um, it shouldn't be something that the city does alone. Uh, th third comment there is to consider programs that replace old fixtures to achieve lower water use rate. And that's specific to policy EN 5.4. So I want to stop here on this environment element. Any questions? I think I might have made the developed collaboratively just because yeah, I don't, you know, I'd hate to see us put a lot of effort and work <clears throat> into defining something for ourselves that is hard to implement without, you know, regional partners. Um, plus, the environment isn't generally just something we work on as a as a city or as a neighborhood, but it's you know something that we kind of have to buy into with our partners. And if we are looking down the wrong lens, and you know larger organizations are work, looking at a different lens, then, um, you know, we're kind of, we end up battling each other. So that was yeah. my thoughts there. And I guess for my purposes, just a temperature check, were you able to read through those um, element sections that were distributed? I think we're yeah. good to move on. All right, um, on to the recreation parks and open space element. Um, what's addressed in the narrative um, is there was a comment on providing an inventory of existing parks and their classifications. So uh, the map here sort of shows the existing parks and the classification as they appear. 
on our recreation parks and open space element. Um, and then pointing to the ARPO's master plan, um, which was adopted in 2022 for um, pointing to more detailed plans, um, so providing those references. In terms of implementation strategies, um, implementing a wayfinding system for parks and identifying opportunities to enhance parks. So those are themes that we've seen um, not only from Planning Commission, but also from the RPAC committee um, and the DEIC, the uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Commission as well. Um, comments on goals and policies. So there was a comment on using safe rather than safer when discussing pedestrian and bicycle routes. Um, I guess whoever made the comment, if you want to expand on that, um, I would say that it, that was a specific recommendation on language um, by our city engineer. So, and and maybe I could just speak to that for a moment. Uh, it's kind of a risk a risk management appropriate terminology to to indicate you know that our our system is safe, but it needs to be safer. Whereas if we say safe, we're implying that it's unsafe. And I don't think we have all the data to really support that, so. I think this is my comment. Um, so I think um, what I would like to see is for us to find some standard uh, or threshold that's like a baseline minimum level of like safety and comfort for, um, you know, various classes. Like I think we're trying to get what an all ages and abilities network together. Um, whether that's towards the new, I don't rather remember whether it was Ashto or NACTO released the um, like most recent bicycle sort of traffic engineering standards or guidelines. Um, but I would think that um, eventually the, the, the language we use here would tie into some kind of definition that would then mm -hmm. reference one of those standards. So when I hear safer, safer, it, you know, sort of stands out to me as a little bit Weekly language, but I think we eventually want it to become something that is more defined and then is a standard we can measure against. We can definitely do some research, look into that. I've I've heard low stress as one particular term, but we'll we'll look into the NACTO standards and see. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't. I don't think it necessarily has to be defined here, but I think the the sort of genesis behind my comment was that um, there should be a definition and we should be measuring against it. Okay. And safer sounds a little less defined. I think safe is a little less defined too. So I think what you're saying is your intent is, is that we're moving towards a standard that's measurable versus kind of using arbitrary language, which is what is safer, what is safe. Right, something okay. we can define, something that, um, you know, sure. the, the latest engineering is coming out with, something that we can then okay. say, okay, Jared. Yeah. Eight-year-olds can do this based on this, that, and the other. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. Great. Quick, just more of a question on, you know, placement. For me, when I think of bicy bicycle lanes, I kind of think of it more as a transportation element component as opposed to a um, parks and open space component. Um, is, is this going to be living in the parks and rec element or is it kind of duplicated in transportation as well? Um, it's duplicated as well. I, I think the point here is that there's that conduction between our park system and transit routes and that's been a common comment we've heard is the importance of those, um, that connectivity. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, moving on to the housing element. So in the narrative, you'll see a summary of the existing housing inventory. Um, there's an update on allocated housing units and strategy for achieving housing unit development with limited undeveloped land, um, referencing the housing needs assessment, land capacity analysis, and the racially disparate impacts. Um, in terms of implementation strategies, um, there's a, a strategy there to develop a housing action plan. 
Secondly, expanding the multi multifamily tax exemption program. So currently we have that program for town center. So um, expanding it beyond town center. Work the streamline permitting process for ADUs and the middle housing specifically. And then considering establishing a housing task force. Any further comments there? I think we're good. Okay. Um, on the goals and policies, there was a comment on adding cooling, active shading, air, fi air filtrations um, as additional call outs of sustainable building measures. Um, concern over lack of parking requirements causing accessibility issues for those with mobility issues and at child care slash schools and concerns about overflow parking on uh, neighborhood neighboring areas. There's support for advocating the legislature to support help fund home ownership programs and then suggestion to include community integration plans for housing and service to program development and emphasizing proactive coordination efforts. Any questions or comments? I think I guess so the second one concern over lack of I guess I don't know who, whose comment that was necessarily, but it sounds like there's some context behind it that might shed some light into what exactly is meant there. Because I, I wouldn't want to see us put specific requirements on childcare schools that might prevent them from getting built, but it sounds like there's some issues or stories that may have arised in the past that I brought this as a comment. Oh. Uh, Commissioner Harrison, I see you got your hand up. Thank you, uh, Chair Batista. Yes, I think if it's the comment I'm thinking of, it might have been one that I added. Um, the tie was more around the idea of um, people who um, drive their kids to, you know, to school or, you know, they have uh, child care needs uh, because they need to get their kids, you know, they, for whatever reason, they need to, uh, they have to use a vehicle in order to get their kids to school before going to work. Um, so it was more around that, not necessarily anything about like safety or anything uh, uh, safety related or anything along uh, those lines. I have a question for you. Um, was the lack of parking requirements um, your language or was that, um, is that, has that been put into this presentation? Um, possibly, I don't recall what my exact wording was. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the the sort of general thought I was sort of uh, getting to was more that um, if there's not adequate parking, then we kind of ice out. It, uh, it might limit people who have accessibility uh, needs that um, require them to sort of use um, vehicle transportation as their primary uh, mode of transportation. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think um, I would recommend, um, it sounds like you have a, a, specific, a specific concern um, that is addressed with um, accessibility and mobility. Um, <clears throat> when I look at this particular language, it says lack of parking requirements. My mind sort of immediately jumps to like, well, parking minimums that don't necessarily correlate with accessibility issues. Um, would you be opposed if we sort of made it a bit more specific to accessibility issues? No, um, no not at all. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, I know, I know parking is a, it's a, uh, <clears throat> it's one of those finicky issues. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I really hate to bring it up, but uh, you know it was a concern. I think the example I'm just coming to that was sort of coming to mind is you know as you may know I work in next door in Briar, and um, it's a community that doesn't. There's only one bus route that uh, goes through town, and it only goes you know once a day, mm -hmm. or, well twice a day. Yeah, sorry, once in the morning and once in the afternoon, and for you know, if you did not have a vehicle, I mean, there's not very many businesses, but just using that as a sort of antithetical example, if you did not have a vehicle getting to and from town, unless you lived very close by, which 
fortunately I do, but uh, getting to and from town would be very difficult mm-hmm. if you like worked in town or you, you had any sort of business that you needed to get into town. Um, and I have known people who have had um, accessibility needs or who uh, uh, for whom not having a vehicle would uh, negatively impact their ability to just you know live their lives uh, mm-hmm. from day to day. Yeah, so I think um, those are all really good points, and I'm glad you're bringing them up because I think um, also if we don't, uh, other people will. Um, so it's definitely an important conversation to have. Um, I think um, the way this is phrased in this particular presentation um, is like, I, I don't know, this might be a little bit nitpicky, but it's like presupposing a particular path of action and so I think if it were rephrased in a more open way um, to more accurately describe the concerns over mobility and accessibility and lack of access to other modes of transportation, um, and how do we solve that? Like that might be a way of phrasing it that then doesn't immediately get translated into like, you know, three parking spots per house or something. Thank you. Yeah, we can go back. Absolutely. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, sorry. You can go. Oh, no, I was going to say, I, you know, I, I'm always in favor of, uh, I think, being as specific as possible uh, with the phrasing and uh, terminology is helpful. So, yeah. We can go back to the exact comment just to make sure we're not um, misspeaking here. So um, we'll definitely rephrase that and ensure that's addressed. Yeah, I would, I would just add uh, on the um, concerns about o- uh, parking overflow in the neighborhood areas. You know, that's been a big topic of conversation ever since we had kind of our first mixed use development come into the town center and the fact that they've decoupled parking from the rental of the unit itself. And so there's plenty of space in the garage, but the people don't want to pay extra for that space. So they're parking in the neighborhood causing, you know, at, at times, you know, significant impact. And obviously that's only going to compound the, as more development, uh, you know, comes in. And it's, um, you know, it's a concern. I know, I know the Planning Commission in years past has even talked about having, you know, maybe like having some sort of neighborhood zone parking and, you know, restricted. It's like, if, you know, if you live in a building that has a parking lot, <laughs> That's where you're going to park your vehicle, you know, because uh, there's there's plenty of people, you know, um, who aren't living in that building, who are living adjacent to that building, who are being negatively impacted uh, by that. So I, I know that's been a, an ongoing conversation for, well, over a decade and a half now. So. Yeah. If I remember right, we were looking at one point, or maybe it came up of like a parking management system, mm-hmm. right, for street parking. Like I'd almost rephrase this one as parking management and impacts to neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. Like I think parking overflow sort of like stems from a lack of management almost. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I probably would suggest putting that into transportation. We'll have to check and see if we have any strategies around that. But very common when light rail is being implemented that communities start to really look at that phased parking management approach. And it could include neighborhood permit or parking zones as part of that, you know, and starting to really evaluate where those would be. So so it's a good first step and a good strategy to explore or um, consider um, a phased approach to parking management. Um, and we'll, we'll check and see what kind of language we have in transportation on that already. Yeah, I think we definitely need to do that. And also in light of middle housing requirements around the light rail station where we will um, not be able to require parking within a half mile of the light rail station um, for middle housing. So um, it will be impacts to light rail or from light rail, and then lack of us requiring parking for some land uses, coupled with 
uh, the increase of commercial um, use in town center, then um, I'm sure um, when we're talking businesses that they will probably not appreciate, um, you know, uh, the lack of parking enforcement. I mean, on private property, the city can't do anything per se, but it will it will definitely become an issue as we move forward. More of even more of an issue when we move forward. I also think there's an element of parking management that is often overlooked. Of like, you know, it is very stressful when you have to, you know. You're driving to the restaurant and you've got the one parking space and they're all full and then you're driving around and like you have no idea where else to go and the streets are all like you can't park here like um i think there also needs to be a more of like an active guidance like a signage like a wayfinding like you know the systems also to you know it's not just like controlling how long the cars stay there but it's also providing guidance on where you go and how you get there and like you know ways that are not stressful um so maybe beyond the scope of this, but something I think we should be exploring as part of this overall parking discussion. Yeah, I think there's good examples, you know, parking management strategies where the, the different lots, you know, they come together in terms of the type of monitoring systems they have. So you, you could even have a sign that, you know, you'll, you see them in other parts, you know, in Seattle, even in Totem Lake, you, got, you know, the lot will say, you know, parking here and it'll say 200 stalls available. And, you know, the next one down the street, you know, 100 stalls available. And, you know, so it, it makes it really easy, kind of kind of reduces that anxiety that, oh, I'm never going to be able to find parking because, you know, right away, you do, oh, I don't even need to bother pulling in there because there's no spots or, oh, it's telling me it's, you know, it's wide open and it's really easy. So, and, you know, I think that since that's on private property, I think that's more, you know, on them to provide. But obviously the city, I guess, could the city require that of, of of those developments to include that? Yeah, I system? think it would just be, you know, more of a partnership because at, at the end of the day, the, you know, both parties want to work out a, a equitable situation, right? Where um, the businesses want to make sure that they're not disincentivizing people coming to their businesses. And at the same time, the city just making sure that there's, you know, enough places for the surrounding residences to be able to park. So, yeah, I think it's, you know, it's going to be a multi-phased approach. And then ultimately, yeah, you kind of could end up with, you know, like what the bigger cities end up with, um, LA, Vancouver, Seattle, et cetera, where you also have the residential programs, right, where you have permits in the different residential areas that are in close proximity to commercial areas or in the case of LA, I think everywhere, but um, anyways, you know, I think we'll, we'll definitely be having to look at those strategies. So I think parking management and including some language in there and then the details are part of what we can work on. Yeah. And if we become really successful, you know, we could always get an old tram from a Disney world parking lot and like drive between like, I mean, you know, you, it's, it, like, you know, no matter how bad we be big we get, right? Like there's always some kind of solution we can look at that doesn't involve you having to drive right to the like one precious parking spot right next to your place. So I think, um, you know, if we can be open-ended about that kind of thing, like I think there are some options we could look at that don't involve just, you know, trying to make everyone put the parking right next to the place where they are. Is it Disneyland and Disney World or just Disneyland <laughs> that we have to get the tram from? I've never actually been to Disneyland, so <laughs> I'm only familiar with the Disney World ones. Okay. So. <laughs> All right, I think we're good to move on. All right, um, in terms of the economic vitality element, so in the narrative, we identify those. Um, so major commercial centers, which we have three noted here, uh, secondary commercial nodes, um, there's two noted here, and then neighborhood nodes. And then in the narrative, we sort of define what those are. Um, another change is to point specifically to the economic development strategic plan um, as a functional plan, uh, which provides more detailed information for that five-year um, short-term um, strategy. And then 
implementation strategies, uh, develop an inventory of underutilized lands. Uh, so we do have that buildable lands inventory and then land capacity analysis uh, to point to uh, strengthen relationships and collaboration efforts. And then consider zoning opportunities or bonuses to achieve desired development. I'll pause here. Any comments or questions? Weren't there more dots before? <laughs> yeah, that was going to be my question too. <laughs> um, were there? Hmm. I don't remember. Yeah, the last. Yeah, we can uh, check. We can track back and check. Yeah. yeah. The last, uh, the last document I saw had more dots. Um, I think these are the ones that exist, and there were some that are proposed that like don't currently exist. Um, You're right. Yep. Yeah. You know, I you know we're still going through the environmental impact statement, but you know we should make sure those two align at the end. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the other uh, question I had was the inventory of underutilized lands, uh, based on what we saw during the economic development strategy. It looked like there were some weird little parcels kind of hovering out in the middle. I was wondering, um, does that include subtractions from um, environmentally critical areas in the developability of the parcel? So there's a percentage um, when you're doing the buildable lands analysis. I believe it's a 25% factor that's used overall that you're going to say approximately 25% of these lands can't be utilized for development. Um, and, and that's plus or minus. Probably in our case it would be a plus because typically there's a reason a lot of these properties haven't been developed um, and they're going to have critical areas or they're going to be more difficult to develop. In saying that, we don't have a lot of available vacant land, frankly. Um, and so it's, you know, it's a very small percentage that we do have. But yeah, that's taken into account as part of the whole formula of buildable lands. Okay. Okay. So for goals and policies, um, again, the request placed that strong reference to the economic development strategic plan. A uh, suggestion to use underutilized commercial and light industrial properties for interim real retail use. Um, acknowledging the need to simplify commercial multifamily building permit application processes. Um, so separating small tenant improvements from major projects to encourage small businesses to grow. Um, and then suggesting the creation of a pre-checklist or flow chart um, for permits. Any comments or questions? I, I have that last one just because I'm helping a friend who's opening a beer and wine shop up the street. And I found it interesting that he had to go through all of the same checks and permitting and, and processes that someone would for essentially a, a new construction building. And as we have more and more small tenant and small retail spaces, I think making it easier for smaller businesses to move in and um, build out their spaces would would be beneficial and then you know one thing that I, I think we ran into when reviewing some stuff is yeah just having a nice like flow chart of do this you know step one step two step three that may exist but it wasn't online when we were looking for it at the time so. yeah we're transitioning software actually um at the end of this month and we're working on exactly what you're talking about so, and I couldn't agree more, that's called tenant improvement. And so we should be making that process easier than harder. So. TI is very different. Taken. New, new construction, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was gonna be my question too. Just was like, I would assume a TI permit is gonna be a little bit easier process than building the actual building itself. So, really interesting. Well, I would say it is easier. Say we just need to make it easier, easier, yeah. Okay, I think we're good. All right. Well, that concludes sort of a summary of what's uh, included in those element sections, so the, the narrative and then the goals and policies and implementation strategies. Um, in terms of next steps, um, where are we? 
So yeah, um, we are getting closer to that planning commission recommendation. So September 9th, we'll have tentative uh, public hearing with planning commission. Um, we are towards the end of the draft EIS process. So we just published that and we have a public comment period, like I said, um, that ends August 30th. Um, the next meeting will have a part two, um, looking over the elements of the land use, transportation, capital facilities, and utilities. Um, and then just for city council, we are going back for a final council briefing on August 22nd. Um, and then we're holding September 12th as the start of the formal review process that's pending a planning commission recommendation. And with council, we hope to have a public hearing and adoption by October 16th. I think that that is it. So any questions or, yeah. Not, not so much a question, more of a comment slash request. Um, so I'm assuming the next meeting is just, uh, uh, is just a work session, mm -hmm. um, but it is really helpful, especially with these PowerPoint presentations when the graphics are kind of small, to be right in front of the screen. Even though n the next meeting might only be a work session, is okay if we can sit up here to be able to Absolutely. To do it. Okay. Thank you. It's, yeah. Shannon, it's, remind me. <laughs> remind us. But yes, I absolutely. Um, I have to look at this screen, which I know. says yeah. something for well, my When eyesight. we're down there, I'm, I'm noticing several people, yeah. including me, sometimes have to turn I'm around like, to look at this. I'm like, you know, so I'm looking so. at that. Yeah. And yeah. so now I'm used to this. You know, when we first got it, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so huge. And now I'm like, yeah, I need like that size right there. So. Um, yeah, I think that's great um, for you guys to be up there and just have things very visible. So absolutely. And, and honestly, at least for me, that's kind of a general comment for all of our work session meetings. I don't know how other people feel, but especially if there's something that's going to be on a screen. Yeah, and I would say that or um, getting you guys tablets, um, which either or I'm trying, I've been trying to work on on both, so um, we'll get there, but yes, absolutely. You guys can be up there for your meetings, so. Awesome, thank you. Anybody else, questions, comments? All right, I, I win comment of the night. Okay, <laughs> I just wanna double check with our online commissioners if they had any, any, any additional questions, comments. Uh, nothing for, for me. Yeah, no, thank you. All right, cool. Thank you. All righty. All right. So is that the end? Um, yeah, I'll just say I know we sort of breezed through that, but um, we are, if you have any comments, um, just um, make sure to bring those to the September 9th meeting um, for your recommendation so that we can Ensure that that's included on the, the version that the council ultimately gets. So. Is there going to be another um, document that we're wanting that you're requesting for us to like submit comment on, like we've had for the last few meetings, or just bring our comments if we've got comments? You're going to have a draft, a full draft okay. um, that. Um, you'll be able to review and we're trying to keep it to the content itself. Mm -hmm. So if there's anything that you guys are seeing um, for us to know, so you'll have that in hand um, as part of your review moving forward. And so you should hopefully feel good about getting to the point of your public hearing that everything's been put in the document that you want to see. Um, and then that will move to council for their review. We um, briefed council on, I'm losing track, Jonathan, Thursday on middle housing. And so um, once you're done with um, the comp plan and making that recommendation, then um, you've got your work cut out for you on further discussing um, some of the 
um, some of the fun stuff, which is middle housing. We'll be doing an update to critical areas. Um, coming up, we'll be doing all of the development regulations coming up. So a lot of, a lot of work ahead but using the, the comp plan as your, as your guiding document. So a lot, of, a lot of work will continue this next year um, once we get um, past the adoption of the comp plan and select the preferred alternative in the EIS. So it's kind of what we got before us. But yeah, you'll have the document in hand. And I had a sort of unrelated question. I had, I can't find it, so I'm hoping staff can point me in the right direction. Um, amongst one of these documents, I actually saw a graphic that broke down where the customer base for our existing grocery stores were coming from. And that's what kind of triggered my thought, you know, the comment that I had earlier with our sort of, you know, the economic uh, uh, development side. and. Um, does staff know on the top of their head what document that that's in so I can look at it again? I can't, I can't seem to remember where I saw that. I thought that was really interesting. Um, I believe you're talking about some work that Leland put together of the different grocery stores that are surrounding the community. Is that what you're talking yeah. about? Where they had QFC, Winco, all the different stores and then kind of the breakout of the grocery stores? No, it actually had our the city map and right. there were kind of bubbles that said, you know, the you know, people living within this bubble are kind of migrating to this store. People that are kind of living in this bubble are kind of migrating. Yeah, I believe that was store. some of the initial work that Leland put together about the whole issue of how many grocery stores we have within proximity, well, within the city and then proximity basically on the outer edge. Does that seem like the same document? They had the Linwood stores, the Edmund stores. They had the stuff that was adjacent in Shoreline I th with different colors on I it. think so. It was one of those cases where I saw the graphic and I was like, oh, that looks interesting. I'll have to circle back to that. And then okay. I couldn't remember I where I needed to circle Leland, back to. I think it's early Leland stuff that we went yeah, through. That was, I think that was part of the economic development studies plan. Yeah. Okay, so I'll look for one of their documents and, and, and see. Okay, that. and if you need some help, we can get that okay. to you. And I just thought, you know, as long as we're on the topic, it's interesting because we really haven't talked about it so much, but it'll be interesting to see how things play out with, you know, the Kroger Safeway merger um, that's impacting one of our grocery stores because they're divesting of all the QFCs except for, I think, the one in the U Village. So the QFC... From what it sounds like, right, might still exist, but it's going to have a different owner. And so it may actually end up changing. Who knows if they're going to actually keep the branding. It may change. They may decide, hey, we had to take it. The store will stay. Yeah. But it's just the sign, the sign of the I don't think it's going to affect our Yeah. We'll, we'll see because, you know, they, they're, it seems like they're taking it on as a brand. So it's just, it'll be, you know, hopefully it'll stay open, but it, it'll be a huge impact if all of a sudden... You know, an east you know an east coast company that doesn't really have a west coast footprint. You know, buying all of the QFCs, they may quickly realize, hey, we didn't know what we were getting ourselves into, and Mount Lake Terrace historically has kind of been on you know kind of the lower end of what you know profit and performability in terms of you know most desirable retail spaces. So I could easily see them saying, oh, no, we're we're closing this one. So cross fingers, knock on wood. But that, I mean, it's. Yeah. Otherwise, I think they were going to just shelf the whole deal. So I, I think what that is is a great stop for us. Hopefully. Hopefully. So, yeah. Anyway. Tangential comment, so. That's good. Anybody else? Sounds like no more questions or comments on this. So thank you very much. All right. So item number seven, uh, director's report. Okay, just a little update on last council meeting, we presented middle housing 
there wasn't decisions that were made, um, but I would say that there is a leaning that council is interested in going with um, the type two for middle housing. So under the guise that we're going to be under tw over 25,000 people very shortly. So we really need to look at um, type two for middle housing um, moving forward. So I um, just to say, I think that the planning commission and city council seem to be somewhat in step with each other as to kind of what we're looking at moving forward for housing typologies. And now will be a discussion of where those typologies are going to go and all the other um, fine things as we work through that. So that's kind of a tentative, just a pulse um, that we received. Tonight, as Jonathan mentioned, we did the open house for the draft environmental impact statement. About 20 to 25 people rolled through from 4.30 to 6.30 um, and we're taking written comments. And then also um, there's a way to comment on the website to make it easier for folks as well to provide um, some comments regarding the EIS, a lot of um, good questions that we received from the people that attended um, this evening, so so that's good. Um, last week, uh, last Tuesday night, was the city's national night out. Um, very well attended. I saw some of you folks there um, doing your community service, which thank you very much, but um, was a very good event. Um, more booths this year, which was super cool. A lot of stuff for the kids, a lot of families out. The weather was actually a little bit cooler that night, which was wonderful. Um, but I heard over a thousand hot dogs served and, um, uh, you know, all kinds of good stuff. Um, so that was good. Jonathan and I were there talking to folks about um, middle housing and then trying to advertise tonight's um, work session as well. So just trying to get the word out on that. Um, and we are um, in the throes of all things community and economic development. Like I said, we have um, an update to all of our permitting um, software that's going into effect. We've been working on this draft EIS and the draft comp plan as well, and then trying to get work done on uh, the middle housing as well as um, other assorted things in the department as well. So um, lots of exciting things that are coming up for you folks. So we appreciate uh, you guys uh, hanging in there with us and having these thoughtful discussions and thinking about uh, really important things that are gonna matter to this community for the next 20 years, um, quite literally. Um, so there's a lot of decisions to be made as we, as we move and think about where we are as a community now and then where we're heading. So um, I appreciate all of your input and thoughts. And if you guys have any follow-up that you're like, I wish I would have said this this evening, please let us know. Um, Cause we wanna make sure that the, the comp plan it um, contains your input um, as we move it to uh, city council, and then we can start working on the development regulations. So, so uh, kind of a you know question comments. You know, you know when we've been talking about, hey, do we go with option one? Do we go with option two? Do we go with option three? You know, we were really hoping for three, mm -hmm. and you know, you and the consultant said three is not feasible. It's just you know, it's it's hard. You know, especially in, you know, in the near term. Um, I've had to sit with that for a while and really let it marinate. And got to be honest, still a little frustrated, you know, by that. Is it possible now as, as part of this process to say, okay, yeah, 
There's, there's no way we can provide the level of service to get to three. But start on that blueprint, what would be required to get to three, or at least, you know, have that commentary or, 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 or discussion, or at least the beginning steps of saying, okay, we, like, we don't have enough water. Right. What would it take to get enough water? Certainly. Uh -huh. Or we don't have enough electricity. What would it take? Or the road network can't, can't, wouldn't be able to theoretically handle it. Now, hopefully there'd be less car driving anyway. But, you know, what, what steps would need to be required or conditions in place? So it isn't a case where we just say, oh, well, we tried. We just, it's not feasible. And then never look at it again. That we have some sort of steps in place where, like, no, we do want to revisit this and really analyze it deep and figure out a way, maybe not to get to three, but to get to another, a, a new 2A or call it 2B or and I, we kind of keep moving the goalposts and everything, but you know, just something that'll give us, get us closer to three, knowing that it's gonna be more long-term because it's gonna involve a lot of, you know, new infrastructure, but right. just so, so that we actually have that thought experiment. So uh, a couple of thoughts I, I have um, is one alternative to gives you about 5,000 more people than you're required to plan for. So you're, you're moving towards alternative three with alternative two right now. I, I would say in, in my thoughts, if, if you read through the EIS, some of those strategies of what we need to do to serve alternative two and think about alternative three are in there. There are things that the city needs to do to get us to meeting the full growth targets for alternative two and thinking about alternative three. The city is working on capital facilities planning um, as we speak, starting that process for water and sanitary sewer. And those are critical um, processes moving forward. All of those plans that are not maybe the funnest, I say that as a planner because they're like all engineering, but that's really where the rubber hits the road is you gotta have water coming out of your faucet. You wanna be able to flush the toilet. You wanna have streets to drive your car and get goods and services. So all of those plans that come out of public works and engineering are really critical for us to do our plans. So we need to, I would say as a city, really focus on those plans even more so than we've done in the past because those are really critical and are foundational. I think we have really good staff to, to, to really hone in and do the, those planning efforts right now. But the best I've seen since I've been here. So I think as a planning commission and as staff, we need to encourage that those foundational plans are put in place because those are the alternative to, those are the alternative three and that's where the planning starts. And then I would say for us, I think we need to focus around starting those mixed use hubs and those neighborhood hubs that we're planning around that those transportation corridors, because if we grow from those centers, those neighborhood centers and those mixed use centers, then we can grow out of that. Just like the town center, we start with the core and we grow out of there. So I think that's how you get from two to three as well. Instead of just a shotgun, a shotgun approach, you guys kind of know what you want. It's in two. And if you look at the difference between two and three, two's really setting the foundation for us to move to that next level. So I think we stay the course. We keep those mixed use centers, those neighborhood centers, Straighten town, strengthen town center, that's the city's core, that's our identity, that's the commercial hub, but we also have those other areas around town like we've talked about. I think that's how you get to alternative three. As, as part of this, because we, we, you know, we kind of touched on it you know, tonight as well, 
when there's to avoid sort of this leakage of potential revenue, we need to have the businesses here. But to have the businesses here, they require a population base. And right now, be, just because of our historic suburban development, while we are a dense city, we clearly don't have the population base to support enough variety of businesses to keep those dollars in the city itself. Right. So as part of this analysis, um, maybe this is more uh, on the economic side of things too, are there like population milestones that would need to be hit before they could say, you hit this population, it's automatically going to create a demand for three more restaurants and four more retail stores and God forbid, another auto supply store, you know, or so, you know, yeah, you know some, something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's basically how it's done is that residential leads retail mm -hmm. period. So how many people am before I invest in this enterprise, because it's a lot of money to open a business, right? That I'm, going to try to do my due diligence to make sure that if I open this, that I can be successful. I don't know the small business um, uh, success rate, but I it used to be about 75% of small business closed within the first five years of opening up. So, you know, we're, we're a community of small business and small business is rough. And I speak from an individual that whose family owned a small business and still does, but you know it's 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 hard, um, and there's a lot of failure because it's very hard to keep these businesses. So when we talk about things that the community wants, like a grocery store, absolutely, and I think that's that also speaks to having a full-time economic development person that goes out there and continues to carry that message to make sure that we're working with other individuals that work for the develop work for certain developers that we're going there out and we're continuing to tell our story to all of these people hey this is much how much houses we have permitted that are coming into the city this is what we're doing here these are the um, improvements that we've made for water capacity fire flow you know all the things that we're doing. Here's the street improvements that we're, we're that we're getting ready to do. All of those things make a difference in getting those other things that the community wants to see. You know, grocery stores, more restaurants. You know, more brew pubs, more um, things that Clark's working on with his friends. A sit-down coffee shop. A you know, hey, wouldn't it be nice if we had these things? So. Yeah, we, we also, you know, it's, um, you have to go out and be proactive in doing these things. And the communities that have, have been successful, but we need to com compete with those communities, you know, instead of people just kind of stumbling on to us. And we've, we've been trying to do that kind of as our side gig, but we, we really are at the point where we need concerted effort to work with the chamber and other groups to get our messaging out there. To say, hey, you haven't been by Mount Lake Terrace for a while. Come check this out. This is what we got going on. So that's what we need to do. But we need to have the, the folks here. But, you know, we've got building one, two, three at uh, Terrace Station. Candela, which is next to the light rail station, is prepping. We have some other major developments, you know, um, that are in, in the permitting phase. So those all make a difference to get those other things that the community has said that they want. So. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? I had a question that built on your question, actually. Sure. Um, so the, um, you know, in my mind, um, you know, alternative two versus alternative three, now that we kind of know the limits of these, I think there's an open question in my mind of, you know, whether we focus on trying to redevelop everything around the transit center or we try to redevelop some of these neighborhoods uh, or try to and maybe bring some into existence. 
Um, well, we have some time to talk about that in the next couple of uh, meetings, or I assume that's when we get the final environmental impact statement. Because in my mind, I think like that is still kind of an open question. Like we've got sort of a range, and like where do we want to dial it in? Where does it make more sense to develop in the transit center, to, or like this thing we already have, or try to lay the foundation for future things? Yeah, I think take a look at the map for alternative two, because I think we're trying to dial in several locations. That's where we show that not only do we have town center, but we have those neighborhoods and, and mixed use um, centers. And so I think it's both of those, it's not, um, I think the difference you saw on the map today is some of those one, some of those mixed use and neighborhood centers were alternative three. Mm, and okay. so we're kind of, if you're going to do two, you're going to have to peel those back a little mm. bit, but they're still on the maps. Okay. So take a look at that alternative two, which is really going to turn into our land use map, which sets the stage for the zoning map. Okay, and if I remember right, um, there, was there a difference in intensity of development between two and three, four around the transit center? I think there was, right? Like within a close in distance. Um, I think there's a little bit more intensity um, kind of south of town center where there mm -hmm. was just a little bit more um, up zoning per, mm -hmm. per se, but there's still up zoning on alternative two. For sure. Okay. So, I mean, and, and we can talk about that, sure, a little bit more on the actual maps themselves. But, um, yeah, I think we can set ourselves up for, for understanding that, you know, that ultimately, ultimately we are going to continue to get more dense. So how is the best way to do that? Because we have limited land supply. Mm-hmm. And the community is going to grow over time. Um, and so, you know, let's set the community up to do that. Maybe it's not all right now, but we're going to set it up for success for the future. Mm -hmm. Not not just the next 20 years, but we're trying to think strategically for like the next 50 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so there is some range to maybe go for like an option three yeah. level of density around the transit Yeah, and I think we case. can we can look at the map and kind of change stuff up. Like I said, we, we're about 5,000 folks over our growth target right now. Mm -hmm. And so there's, I think there's some discussion of, yes, maybe where we want to juggle some stuff around. But I also think it's good. I think the approach where we're really trying to put the growth along transit orient, oriented development is really smart. So, but I think there's, we're still open to say, well then, is this the best place or maybe we wanna put those folks a little bit right here mm -hmm. and that would be better. So absolutely. Okay, but yeah, like uh, alternative to establish sort of the bucket of things yeah. we have and then yep. it's just a matter of like maybe yep. fluffing Lego. some things up yeah. there and pushing some things down yeah. over there. Absolutely. And I think leaving that's... some harder things for the future. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Cool. I think it's a given too that you know a lot of places I know that I've been talking about and hope you know would like to see some sort of redevelopment aren't probably going to redevelop in the near term or anyway because they're already you know aging garden style apartments and you know un un unless somebody comes in and buys those property the existing property owners are probably just fine and dandy with the status quo. So, you know, I don't see much near-term development on there. Obviously, having it zoned to allow for development in the future is great, and hopefully it will develop. But sure. I, I clearly recognize that, you know, in the next three to five years, would we see those large parcels redeveloped? No, probably not. And there's a, you know, there's also that consideration of displacement and affordability. Um, and so, you know, we got to be cognizant of that as a community that, while we support middle housing and trying to make different bands of income um, affordable for folks, I think that, you know, some of these older developments, they do serve a purpose. And when something new and shiny gets built there, 
um, it comes at a cost, which is the rents and, and such. Um, I'll make sure um, the Affordable Housing Alliance put out a study, or um, Chris did uh, kind of a current update, um, and I will make sure that we send it to you folks, but something that really struck me, because I had a couple of minutes to look at it today, that for a median in Mount Lake Terrace, and it, it compares other cities for condos, townhomes, and single family homes, but for a median price single family residence in Mount Lake Terrace, under basically the conditions today, it would take an income of $186,000 to purchase that home. So. I believe it. Let that sink in and then do the math of how many people in our community can purchase a home today in Mount Lake Terrace. Well, I, I know even for rent, um, one of my friends, Amazon, made a move back to Seattle to keep his job. Um, and believe it or not, he moved back home to Terrace. Couldn't believe it. But when he was still in Texas, I was helping him out and took a quick look at, you know, apartment rates. And Northern Lights was charging pretty much the same as our newer apartments. Yeah. And that blew my mind. I'm like, really? Northern Lights? <laughs> North, I mean, so it's like, you know, because you think, oh, that, you know, you think of it as, oh, it's more affordable because sure. it's older. It's not. Yeah. They're, they're charging almost market rate for it. Now, the, probably the, the one difference is, is that maybe their units might have a little bit more square footage. And they've done, Northern Lights have, has done some pretty extensive upgrades as well. Yeah. Some, of, some of the older apartment stock has done quite a bit of upgrades, but yeah, yeah. that just tells you, you know, what, what the market is right now and how difficult, you know, it is um, affordability wise. So I'll, I'll send that to, we'll make sure we get that to all you folks because it's really good to you know, see that and then just understand where different jurisdictions around us are kind of fitting into from from that, but it kind of puts it in perspective. So I moved back to Mont Lake Terrace from Linwood and said I can't afford Mont Lake Terrace, so now they're looking further north. Yeah, which is a lot of folks. Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody else have any uh, questions for the director's report? All right, not hearing or seeing, we'll move on to item number eight, miscellaneous business by call of planning commissioners. Anybody have any miscellaneous business? Any upcoming absences, vacations, et cetera? I just checked the football schedule. There's no Monday night game, so I think I'm good. Go <laughs> <laughs> All right, so not hearing or seeing with that, we'll go ahead and declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone.